Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our uh, very popular weekly cerebrovascular and skull base symposium from the University of Miami. And today we have a treat. It, as those of you who've uh, watched our sessions weekly, you will notice a change in format. And today is, I'm going to call it a neuroanatomical feast of the brain. And that's why we labeled it Behold the Neuroanatomy of the Brain. Uh, this is going to be a fantastic series of five lectures, which I now will introduce the speakers in a, in a second. So this is now our 22nd session today on October 15. I'm Jacques Morcos, the professor and co-chair of the Department of Neurosurgery and director of Cerebrovascular and Skull Base, co-directors of this course. Uh, by now, I'm sure you're familiar with all of us here, Carolina Benjamin, uh, assistant professor in our department. She runs, she's director of the Keynes Dissection Lab and she specializes in brain tumor and skull-based surgery, as well as Mike Ivan, assistant professor in our department, director of research of the UM Brain Tumor Initiative and specializes in brain tumor, skull base and epilepsy surgery, as well as my two endovascular, open vascular partners, Bobby Stark and Eric Peterson. This is beautiful Miami. At the bottom are the two main facilities that we use, University of Miami Hospital on the bottom left and Jackson Memorial Hospital at the bottom right. Now, uh, this is, uh, as you know, I had shown, those of you who've been here many times, I've shown you previous lectures, so now, we have completed the planning of the coming lectures all the way to December 17. You can see at the bottom left is where we are today with session 22. And just to give you a glimpse of what's coming over the several weeks, you can see on the right, and then all the way up till December 17. We'll give you a break on Thanksgiving holiday on November 26. Um, please don't miss, particularly you will notice I, we have four sessions in a row on complications in neurosurgery, both in skull base, endoscopic and open, and vascular, uh, open and endovascular. You will see those four weeks in a row. Uh, that's based on the demand from you, the audience. You wanted speakers and panelists on complications. Again, to remind you housekeeping instructions for tonight, I am sure you will have questions because you're going to be shown some detailed, uh, exquisite neuroanatomy. If there are any points in any of the speakers you don't uh, points you don't understand, please type your questions in the Q and A box, and we will handle all questions after all speakers have spoken. I've asked them to speak for about twenty minutes uh, each, approximately. Uh, I've made the sessions, but if you still have ideas or suggestions of topics or speakers for future sessions, please email me or you can write to me. You follow me on Twitter. Uh, next week, for example, we have a fantastic session on intraoperative visualization uh, with augmented reality. Uh, we have four speakers, uh, Doc Walter Jean, Akio Morita, Josh Betterson, and Bernard Bendock, all of them will be speaking about different technology with fluorescence, augmented reality, virtual reality in both skull base and cerebrovascular. As you know, my partner Mike Ivan has been doing a very popular Wednesday series along with this Thursday series on brain tumors in general. And next Wednesday, uh, we have Eric Luthart from WashU, who will talk about laser interstitial thermal therapy, the WashU experience, please uh, join us as well. Many thanks to the team that makes these webinars happen, Ingrid, Roberto, Cristina, and particularly Ignacio, who is with us uh, every week here running the show. You can connect with us through these various links. You can see on the slide, departmental Instagram, Twitter, uh, well, uh, or if you want to watch sessions that you have missed, they're all on our YouTube channel. You can find it in the yellow box there. You can go back and watch whatever you'd like. 
Now, as I said, today is really special day. I mean, uh, neuroanatomy is, is just the passion of many of us, including myself, the mysteries of the brain. We, the, the five speakers you will see here, of course, uh, today are in the tradition of Al Roten, who we've lost, as you know, four years ago, but his legacy continues in some of his fellows. You can see them down there in the picture of the North American Skull Bay Society meeting three years ago. So we're gonna celebrate neuroanatomy. So I don't want to spend too much time introducing them because I really don't want to take time from their lectures, but just very briefly in the order in which they will speak, Guillerme Carvajal Ribas, professor of surgery at University of Sao Paulo, neurosurgeon at Albert Einstein Hospital, has had a long-standing relationship with the University of Virginia, where he is a visiting professor, and has uh, held uh, has taught many the Cambridge series of court courses. They're spectacular. Guillermo is a pioneer, really. Um, he is the first one to have thought of stereoscopic uh, anatomical education decades ago. Honestly, probably before Al Roten, and probably suggested it to Al Roten. Guillerme has, not only does he study anatomy in an exquisite way, but he studies it in a very practical way. And that's what he's going to talk to you about today. He can talk to you about days about this, but he chose to discuss the gyri and sulci around the frontal opercular area. Wen Hung Zhu, uh, when I first met him, when he was a fellow with Roten and I was dabbling in the lab myself, Rotten's lab. I wasn't a Rotten fellow. And, and when to this day probably has some of the best dissections, well, I have seen, I haven't seen everybody's dissections, but when created exquisite dissections back in 1994, I witnessed his work firsthand. Of course, since then he's become, uh, he's had a spectacular career, professor of neurosurgery at the University of Sao Paulo, has a particular interest in epilepsy surgery, and of course his passion for cortical and temporal lobe anatomy has not died off. And today he's gonna to talk to you about the mesial temporal lobe and how you can use that knowledge in your clinical practice. Jeff Sorensen, friend for many years, of course, neurosurgeon at Sam's Murphy Clinic in Memphis. Uh, one of his residents is my current uh, spectacular fellow, Nicholas Kahn. Uh, Jeff has done all of us a tremendous service by making the Rotten collection accessible, by his, he's a master skull base surgeon and open vascular surgeon. And as you will see for what he has done uh, for the field of neuroanatomy, uh, we, we owe him fantastic thanks. Juan Carlos Fernandez Miranda, it always takes me longer to introduce him, uh, to, to say his name than to introduce him, but I love Juan Carlos. Juan is a professor of neurosurgery and otolaryngology now at Stanford. Uh, of course, he's, you all know him uh, for his years in uh, UPMC at University of Pittsburgh for the pioneering work he has done, not only as a former Roten Fellow and neuroanatomy, but uh, of course, one is a most accomplished skull-based surgeon, both open and endoscopic. And uh, you, will, you will always recognize a true neuroanatomist when you see his operative videos, you know when a surgeon practice and technical skills are based in neuroanatomy. And you will recognize today he's gonna talk about what he believes is the key role of the foramen lacerum, as I think he calls it, the last key to the skull-based temple. So I'm looking forward to seeing this. And last but not least, Maria Perez Seldas, who is now assistant professor of neurosurgery at Albany Medical College in Albany. I believe Maria has been there for two years. Prior to that, of course, she was a Rotten Fellow. She was also at a skull base clinical fellow with Mike Ling at Mayo Clinic. Maria's dissections are some of the most exquisite I have seen. I haven't seen her work personally, but through her publications, she has had a fantastic a book on the head and neck. And today she's going to talk to us about temporal bone anatomy as it applies to the neurosurgical practice. So, so you can see what a fantastic lineup we have. And I'm going to stop talking.
and I'm going to stop sharing my slides. Uh, Iggy, if you please yeah, stop sharing my slides. Guillermo, I invite you to share your screen, unmute your microphone, and go ahead. And let's start the, the party going. Well, initially, Jax, thank you very much for this invitation to talk at the University of uh, Miami Symposium and to be part of this select neuroanatomy group you did put together. Let me just close here. Okay, within this generic title that uh, Jax gave us, uh, I chose to speak more particularly about the controversial concept of the temporal stem and of this hidden valley, which is the basal forebrain, in the sense that it interests for us neurosurgeons, which is uh, about its regional anatomy, about its topographical anatomy. So it's pretty much an anatomical lecture about these concepts. I want to also initially thank Richard Paraga, who was our fellow together with Evandro at Evandro's lab, and who did most of the dissections I'm gonna be showing you. And of course, thank Evandro for making all this possible. Authors like the very well-known cognitive neurologist and behavioral neuroanatomist, Marcel Mezulan, and the famous neuroanatomist, Leonard Heimer, who described in details the ventral striatum and the extended amygdala, and uh, with who I had the privilege to study and do some dissections while in the University of Virginia, uh, these authors consider the basal forebrain as part of the cerebral mantle with all old phylogenetic uh, structures that are in, and that's what uh, we would like to talk about. Start remembering that the creation of man was not so miraculous as here painted by William Blake, but according to our current knowledge, since the origin of earth, it took 1 billion years for us to have the first unicellular element. And then it took more 3 billion years for us to have the first vertebrate uh, element, the first ver vertebrate organic element, which is uh, primitive fish. Then in the last 315 million years, the CNS underwent an explosion, explosion of, of evolution until the uh, emergence of uh, human beings about 120,000 years ago, uh, only about 120,000 years ago. And this process happened throughout a progressive uh, development of more complex neural structures, uh, parallel to the involution of some of these structures that became vestigial, just like the anterior commissure that was the main commissure for ancient reptiles. And now, we have just a little bit of these uh, very, very old commissure fibers. In primates, parallel to the development of the whole brainness itself, ultimately we have a more bigger development of the prefrontal areas, as you can see here in the slides without the details. And altogether, the brain in the last three to four million years did increase three to four fold with particularly more due to the increase of connections and more particular to increase of short connections. Very interesting this. Uh, in cortex, in the cortex, we have pretty much the same evolution pattern with the bending and enfolding mechanisms being responsible for a threefold increase of our cortical extent with a final result that only one third of the surface is exposed. The other two thirds are buried inside our soci and inside our fissures. Regarding the cytoarchitecture, this evolutionary development took place throughout a progressive and proportional decrease of allocortical areas that uh, in the human, the, 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 the isocortex was developed beginning in this very inner uh, medial ring of allocortical areas and from here superiorly and uh, forming the whole brain that we have nowadays and ending up with the basal forebrain and mesotemporal lobe harboring the human cortical areas that we intend to talk about here. Okay, starting our dissection by removing the frontal parietal operculum and the temporal operculum without getting into details, we can see the insula with its apex originating the short gyra of the insula, separated by the central sucos of the insula from the long gyra of the insula, with the central sucos of the insula continues with the central sucos of the brain, 
and with the insula surrounded by the anterior limiting sulcus, superior limiting sulcus, and inferior limiting sulcus of the insula. Now let's focus in this most anterior and inferior part of the insula, which is the limbing insula. Understanding that the limbing insula is the most lateral aspect of the anterior perforate substance that as we're gonna be seeing is the basal, is the floor of the whole basal forebrain as we're gonna be talking about. The anterior perforate substance has as its anterior limits, both olfactory stria, as the medial limit, the interhemispheric fissure itself, as posterior limit, the optic tract, and as lateral limit, the limbing insula we just talked about. And in order to dissect it from lateral to medial, let's initially discuss this controversial concept of what is called the temporal stem. The temporal stem was initially, this term was initially used by Horel, which he was a, a radiologist together with his associates, and is derived from the fact that the white matter fibers of the temporal lobe converge and look like a real stem here at its medial aspect. And that's why they gave you this name temporal stem, which is, was a very generic name. Now, it's interesting that uh, Feindel and Rasmussen in the Montreal Neurological Institute, which is the mecca of epilepsy surgery in our temporal lobectomies, also did, did use this term temporal stem in order to refer to all fibers that were running along the inferior limiting sucos of the insula. Now, if we look to all these fibers together and do a very careful dissection here, we can see that in this dissection that was done by Leonard, Miner, him, Leonard Heimer himself, and I was just assisting him, we can see that there are, there are two very, very well distinct group of fibers. One group of fibers that covers the inferior horn, the temporal horn, and another group of fibers anterior to it. If we remove this fibers that are covering the inferior horn and all together we call them sagittal stratum, we can not only see the ventricle, but we can see that we have another group of fiber that looks very much like a peduncle anterior to it, anterior to the inferior horn. And this peduncle is constituted by the uncinate fascicle, the occipital frontal fascicle, or, or IFOF, as is more popular known now, also constituted by the upper extension of the amygdala and harbors inside the anterior commissure, as you can see here. And it's a very, very well-defined peduncle. And we understand this peduncle as in, in according to some authors and in, in not according to other authors, we do consider, we do understand that the temporal stem is just, is this peduncle here. And for, particularly for the reason that this peduncle is a, it's, it's a unique anatomical feature of the temporal lobe, of the mesotemporal lobe. The other lobes don't have such a feature. So we understand this as being the temporal stem. In order to understand the continuity of the temporal stem, with the basal forebrain where we wanna get. Let's start another dissection now done by Richard, as I already mentioned, removing again the operculi, in this case, seeing the superior longitudinal fascicle, going a little bit quick in this dissection is this first steps. And then when removing this, the, the insular cortex, of course, we have the extreme capsule, which are the subcortical of the U fibers of the insular cortex itself. It's a little bit hard to see the claustrum in the sagittal dissections. And if we move this, we can see maybe a little bit of the calcium now together with the external capsule that it's pretty much in the same plane as the IFOF that we're seeing here and the uncinate fascicle that is just anterior. If we remove this posterior, this dorsal aspect of the external capsule, of course, we can see the striatum, the, the, the putamen, the lateral part of the striatum, receiving the cortical striatal fibers here. And the IFOF was left here together with the uncinate fascicle. And you can see very well that the uh, occipital frontal fascicle, also called the inferior frontal occipital fascicle, lies just behind the uncinate fascicle. And many times in this dissections, you can distinguish between both of them. Now, if we remove the putamen, we can see the globus pallidus, of course, now with internal capsule fibers. And now, if we look carefully, anterior to the globus pallidus, we can, very, we can see a very well, pretty, almost very well defined compartment. This compartment then is, it's medial, it's medial to what we've been calling the temporal stem, which was the speed uncle we just talked about, and has as its posterior wall, the ventral aspect, the globus pallidus itself, the anterior commissure running along the most basal and ventral aspect of the globus pallidus, 
has as its roof the, in, the fibers of the anterior limb of the internal capsule, has as its floor the anterior perforate substance itself, as an anterior wall would have the IFOF and the uh, uncinate fascicle, with the IFOF running in here laterally and constituting the most superficial fibers of the so-called sagittal stratum when they open posterior to here. And we have medially the accumbens nucleus that we're gonna be talking more about, that it's pretty much the, the, the center, the, the, the core of the so-called compartment that has had many names until now. Maybe the most common name and most well name is substance nominata. This name is an old name. It's still used by Professor Yasargiu and by Hugo Ture, who I consider a very, very specialist in this area we're talking about. And other than substance nominata, Leonard Heimer used to call this region, this compartment, the ventro pallido striatum region, or with his nickname that he used to say, just the ventro striatum, which ventro striatum we're gonna understand more with the ventro striatum. So that's the compartment, the main compartment we'll be talking about here. To understand better the, 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 the to understand better the accumbens, let's remember that initially, uh, evolutionary and embryological, we have a very single corpus triatum. And evolutionarily and embryologically, with the development, of the, the development of the internal capsule fibers, the projection fibers of the internal capsule fibers, the original striatum, the old striatum was splitted. But since the internal capsule have this fan shape, it turned out that just the dorsal striatum was split, the posterior part of the dorsal striatum was splitted leaving, of course, medially the caudate nucleus and laterally the putamen. Now, given the fan shape of the internal capsule, the most anterior and basal part of the striatum, which is the ventral striatum, was not divided. It's a single, a, single, a single region that puts together, of course, the putamen with the caudate. And this ventral striatum is synonym of accumbens. So the accumbens, the nucleus accumbens is inside this, the, the, the ventral striatum and is the ventral striatum itself. Very interesting to have this in mind. And it's very easy to understand if you come from the splitting of the internal capsule that was gave throughout evolution when the mammals arise and then the internal capsule developed. And also, of course, happens also embryologically as well. So if we come back here, we understand that this is the, uh, the, the, the ventral striatum area, I'm sorry. And if we continue our dissection now by removing the inferior, the, the occipital frontal fascicle and the uncinate fascicle, we can see much better the anterior commissure. Indeed, what we're seeing here is the most lateral aspect of the trunk of the anterior commissure. Because the fibers of the anterior commissure here, they will be open going anterior and mostly posteriorly and joining the so-called sagittal stratum. So the sagittal stratum that has as its more superficial fibers, the I4 fibers that was already removed, now has this anterior commissure fibers. And we can detach this anterior commissure from the globus pallidus. And if we cut the anterior commissure and peel this more superficial fibers here now of the sagittal stratum that corresponds to the anterior commissure fibers, we can see uh, just inferiorly the most basal fibers of the sagittal stratum, which are mostly the optic radiation fibers that are intermingled within the so-called sagittal stratum. As Ture says in his dissections, it's very hard to say that we are dissecting just one contingent of fibers. These fibers are all intermingled, they are all together. And here, of course, we have this lateral aspect of the hemispheric part of the anterior commissure at, as it was called by Theodore Miner. If we did push this anteriorly, we can see very well the channel of Graciolet, that it's always as this very well-defined groove where the anterior commissure runs, posterior to the accumbens and anterior, just at the base of the ventral globus pallidus. And we can see in this beautiful Richard dissection, the amygdala that is just anterior to the head of the hippocampus, extending superiorly and blending with the globus pallidus. The amygdala is continuous with the globus pallidus, as you all know. And of course, this is laterally all inside what the speed uncle that some believe in call it the temporal stem and that it's continuous with this compartment that we're talking about. Now, this is another interesting, very nice dissection where you can see the nucleus accumbens here. 
And you can see the anterior commissure coming posterior to the accumbens, midline, and then going to the other side. And here we can see the amygdala. The biggest part of the amygdala is the central medial amygdala. And we can see what we call the ansa peduncularis. The ansa peduncularis is the group of fibers that are amygdala fugal fibers, fibers that are coming outside the amygdala and going medially. We have here the thalamic, the thalam, amygdala thalamic fibers, amygdala hypothalamic fibers, and the most superficial are the amygdala septal fibers that go to the septal region, that go to the septal region. And these fibers that are more superficial, that can be seen here in the intact anterior perforate substance as a very small crest. This small crest here corresponds to the most superficial amygdala fugal fibers, which are the amygdala septal fibers. And of course, here we're seeing the intact anterior perforate substance, lateral limit, lateral limit, the, 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 the limbing insula, medial limit, the, 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 the interhemispheric fissure at the septal region that we'll be talking about, and anterior limit, this of both of factor stria. And it's very interesting to understand that the, the cumbens is lying just at the inside, at the bottom of the olfactory sulcus of the olfactory tract. In this other very nice dissection, we can see here the anterior cumbens, the cumbens was removed, the cumbens, was re, the cumbens is, is still here in this side, but you can see here the anterior commissure now coming between both components of the fornix. We always remember the fornix as its post-commissural fibers, which is the biggest component of the fiber, of the fornix that goes towards the mammillary body. But there is a pre-commissural group of fibers that goes exactly to the septal region. This is here in the interhemispheric fissure. And the anterior commissure passes just in between these two components of fiber. That's why it's called post-commissural fibers and pre-commissural fibers of the fornix. And now at this side, what, since the accumbens was removed here, we can very see this very old part of the anterior commissure here that's phylogenetic, very old, that Theodore Miner called the olfactory part of the, of, of the anterior commissure. Theodore Miner divided the, the anterior commissure in an hemispheric part, which is this one, in olfactory part, which is this one. Of course, this is a vestigial structure, but it's lying inside this basal forebrain we're trying to talk about here. Coming back to our, to our uh, 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 compartment here, which is the ventus striatum or substantia nominata. And recently, I, I remember having seen uh, Michael Lawton referring to this region as the uh, anterior perforate substance region. He was showing a cabinoma in this region. And I think that anterior perforate substance region is also a good name. And again, so with the cumbens here medially continues laterally with the so-called temporal stem. Now, very important to have in mind always that this compartment we're talking about has as its basal wall, the anterior perforate substance, and as its posterior wall, the anterior commissure. And hence we have the perforating arteries coming here, the lenticular perforating arteries coming here, with most of them running just anterior to the anterior commissure, just anterior to the anterior commissure. This is one of the main problems, of course, of dealing with lesions inside this compartment here. While laterally, it continues with the so-called temporal stem. Medially, this region that we're talking about here is continues with the septal region. It continues with the septal region. Septal region or parofactory area of Broca is given by the paraterminal gyri, paraterminal gyrus and the two parofactory gyrus. And it's located just behind what Yasser Gil called the cingulate pole. The single pole is the connection that there is between the superior frontal gyrus together with the rectus gyrus. Rectus gyrus is delineated superiorly by the superior hostal sulcus and heart was inside it, the inferior hostal sulcus. So this is the septal area that we have the septal nuclei, which are the gateway from LO influxes that go to the hypothalamus. So conceptually, the basal forebrain is everything that it's underneath the anterior perforate substance, okay? So it is this lesion, this the substantia nominata or ventus striatal region plus the septal region. All this together, they constitute what we call what with uh, the concept of, uh, of, uh, of uh, basal forebrain. Just as an exercise, let's understand exactly where is this lesion. I like to say that we have to look at uh, MRIs anatomically 
And then a neurosurgeon might not know what a given lesion is, but has to know exactly where it is, has to understand exactly where it is. And here we're seeing a, laser, a lesion very basal, okay, just, just uh, underneath the head of the caudate at the accumbens area. And we, when we see this uh, the MRI, we see here, of course, the anterior commissure. We know that these are the two pillars of the fornix, which are the post commissure of fibers of the fornix. Usually we cannot see the pre commissure of fibers. And we see that this lesion is anterior to the anterior commissure. If we come to this other cuts here, I did proposally put here the bifurcation of the carotid. Because when you see the bifurcation of the carotid, as Evandro always remember, you are just immediately anterior to the anterior perforate substance. When you see this, it's because the anterior perforate substance is right posterior to M1AA1 in the bifurcation of carotid. And of course, this lesion is posterior to the anterior perforate substance. And you see that this lesion is just underneath the accumbens. You see the accumbens is this region here where the caudate joins the putamen laterally. This is the ventral striatum that was not divided evolutionary by the internal capsule. So our, our, our lesion is exactly next to the accumbens. Okay, uh, so our lesion is anterior to the anterior commissure. It's just the next of the, the just inferior to the accumbens is exactly in this region here. It's exactly in this region here. Now, if we understand this anatomy, we can understand that if a glioma, a, a tumor reaches, for example, the temporal stem and goes along the uncinate or just anterior to the uncinate, it will reach the subfrontal region, as we know, and it's very frequent. But if it goes in between the uncinate and the anterior commissure, it will get inside the substance nominata, the ventral striatum region, and will look just look like this here. So we can now understand this anatomy. This tumor is in the temporal lobe, going through the temporal stem and getting inside a compartment that has posterior the anterior commissure and anterior the, anti, the, the anterior perforate substance given by the bifurcation here. It's, it's, it's occupying completely the basal forebrain, the substance nominata region, goes to the septal region and just like a corridor we can see here. And from the septal region, in this case, unfortunately, did go to the other side. If I have more two minutes, one minute, I like to show just a, a, a last dissection, beautiful. If we seen all this we talked about through the pterional perspective, which is more surgical. If we remove selectively the pars triangularis, we'll see the most anterior short gyrus of the insula. If we remove the rest of the operculum, you'll see the upper half of the insula, just posterior to the hashial gyro. If you remove the superior temporal gyrus anterior to the hashial gyrus, you remove the temporal operculum exposing the inferior part of the insula. And if you do a, a, a small hole just, in the, just next to the inferior limiting sucus, you expose the ventricle with the hippocampus. And if you remove the new cortical part, part of the, the temporal lobe, of course, you're left, you're left with the parahypocampal gyrus, the hypocampus amygdala anteriorly, the choroidal fissure just medially here. And you can cut here the upper extension of the amygdala and see the cerebral peduncle. And if you remove completely the parahypocampal gyrus, you see the peduncle here. And now let's just finish seeing this inferior part of the insula to get into the basal forebrain here. If we remove this inferior half, we can see the extreme, extreme capsule and then the external capsule. We can see here the uncinate and the fourth, beautifully in this case. And here we can see the tail of the caudate running along that roof of the, of the inferior horn. And it, removing the external capsule, of course, we have here the putamen, the uncinate still there. If we remove the putamen inferior part, we can see the globus pallidus and the anterior commissure running along the channel of Graciolet, as you can see better here. Of course, this is already the base of the, the accumbens here medially, and we have the internal capsule fibers most anterior, and if we remove them, we can see the connection between the caudate and the accumbens here. And here we can see the end of this beautiful uh, dissection done by Richard. And I just want to end thanking him again for uh, making this lecture possible with this uh, beautiful dissections. And again, thank particularly Evandro for everything he taught us and for everything he provided to all of us. I'm sorry if I didn't go into a little bit more with my time. Thank you very much. That was spectacular as all of your lectures are. And I, I, I like to quote you as you've said in one of our other presentations you gave us, uh, the more you know, the more you see. And that's absolutely true. And uh, we, we all of us quote you about that.
thank you so much uh, uh, for this. Thank this is, I think, a nice segue for when. When could you share your slides and talk to us about the mesial temporal lobe? And unmute your microphone, which I think is unmuted already. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Great. Um, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, everyone. Um, it's a great honor for me to do, to be here with you today. Can you see the screen now? The presentation? Yes, we can. Yeah, we can. Okay. Very good. Great, great. Um, I like to, my talk today is about the mesotemporal lobe anatomy and surgery. And um, I would like to thank Professor Jacques Morcos, my friend, longtime friend. This picture was taken in 1994, 26 years ago. You can see that he, he, haven't, he hasn't changed. Maybe yeah, sure. now he has a, a bigger mustache, something like that, but uh, still very handsome. I uh, thank him very much for this invitation. And also today in Brazil is Teacher's Day. So I would like to acknowledge, you know, to I'm eternally grateful to Dr. Roten and also to Dr. Evandro de Oliveira for giving me the opportunity to learn anatomy and to apply the anatomy I learned in surgeries to help my patients. Mesotemporal lobe. Because of the time, you know, and also because I want to show you the key anatomical landmarks that you can apply in your surgeries. So We'll be, I'll be speaking just very briefly, not about anatomy, but about, about the anatomical features that are important in our surgery. So this is the region we are talking that we're gonna talk about. Parahippocampal gyrus, uncus, and all the structures located inside the ventricle. So what's important here? The, we have uh, anatomical structures of mesotemporal lobe located inside the ventricle. We have anatomic structures located outside the ventricle, outside the temporal horn. But uh, we also have structures that are located in the adjacent to those structures. So for instance, extraventricular structures, uncus, dentate, gyrus, parahippocampal gyrus. And also we have to know what are the interventricular structures, hippocampus, fimbria, amygdala, choroidal fissure, inferior choroidal point. As important as to know the name, the name of the structures is to know the relationship. What's the relationship between the hippocampus and the uncus? What the relationship between the anterior choroidal artery and for instance, hippocampus, ICA and amygdala? Okay, MCA and amygdala and third nerve and uncus. This kind of things we're gonna talk about in this my in my presentation. Just by looking at this picture, what is the message? The message is here. You see the temporal horn is located, is projected onto the middle temporal gyrus. And it's not projected on as far anteriorly as the tip of a temporal lobe there is a distance, a distance about three centimeters. And more important than this, this is the precentral gyrus. So ahead of precentral gyrus is gonna be parcel percularis. So the very anterior tip of the, um, the temporal horn is gonna be projected onto the middle temporal gyrus at the projection, at the transition between the parcel percularis and the precentral gyrus over here. Okay, is this important? Very important. So what is the take home message? Temporal horn is projected onto the middle temporal gyrus. And here we are looking at the uncus. Uncus means hook. So parahippocampal gyrus goes anteriorly and then medially, and then it will fold back backwards, forming this sulcus, which is this uncal notch or hippocampus sulcus. And uncus present an anterior segment, an apex, and a posterior segment. Intermedial surface, apex, post, posterior medial surface, and also an inferior surface for the posterior segment of the uncus. If we make a dissection, if we make, this is a basal view, if we remove 
the parahippocampal gyrus, we can see the under the basal surface of the posterior segment of Duncus with the uncinate gyrus, bend of Giacomini and intralimbic gyrus. Okay. Do I have to memorize, you know, all these things? You don't have to, but it's good to. This is this is the uh, this is the call we call the external hippocampal digitations. We have the internal hippocampal digitations. So this is interlimbic. Please memorize this name. This is fornix dente gyrus. Dente gyrus is located under, below the fornix. And this is thalamus, lateral geniculate body. Thal uh, this is proven out of the thalamus. The fissure located between the fornix and the thalamus is the cryo fissure. Take on message. Take on message for Uncas. Anterior segment present an anterior medial surface, and also presents an apex, and also present a posterior segment. And posterior segment present two surfaces. One is a posterior medial, and one is inferior. And interposing, there will be an uncal notch or hippocampal sulcus between the inferior surface of the posterior segment and the parahippocampal gyrus. Intraventricular structures, hippocampus. Hippocampus means seahorse. So it presents a head. I don't see the left, the medial part of the head in here because it's hidden underneath the globus pallidus, the head, and then we have the body and we have the tail. So where's the division? Where starts the head and where is the beginning of the body of the hippocampus? So if, if we pay attention here, we can see that the inferior cryo point, the red dot is the anterior cryo artery and the, the blue dot is the inferior ventricular vein. Lateral genicular body is here. The beginning of the cryo plexus indicates the beginning of the cryo fissure. The beginning of the cryo fissure indicates the beginning of the body of the hippocampus. Ahead of the inferior cryo point is going to be the internal digitations, hippocampal digitations, and it's also here ahead of the inferior cryo point. It's going to be the head of hippocampus. Surgically speaking, the end of the tail of the hippocampus is where it meets. The medial wall of the atrium. Medial, of the, medial wall of the atrium is constituted by the bowl of the callosum, continuation of the splenium of the corpus callosum, and also the calcaravis. This is the most important uh, slide of my presentation. Here we can see the hippocampus. This is the inferior cryo point. That's where the cryo plexus and the cryo fissure starts. So you can see that the head of hippocampus is related cisternally to what? To the posterior segment of Duncus. And we can see here is the collateral eminence. We call this an uh, uncle recess. We can see that if you continue medially, this is going to be uh, amygdala is over here. So we're going to see later that amygdala is actually related to the anterior segment of Duncus. And here, is the fembit of the fornix, and here is going to be the parahippocampal gyrus over here, and underneath, below the fornix, is going to be the dentate gyrus. So, what is the take-home message for uncus? Anterior segment is of the uncus is related to the amygdala, and the posterior segment is related to the head of hippocampus. Another interventricular structure, we can see here. This is an axial cut. Here is the hippocampus. And we can, here's the ventricle. And then we can see there's a, a mess. There's a, a, a gray matter structure over here. This is amygdala. So amygdala is, is located anteriorly ahead of the head of hippocampus. Okay. So amygdala is also the anterior wall of the temporal horn. But if we look at this coronal cut over here, we can see this is the head of hippocampus. This is a collateral eminence. This is a temporal horn. And this is globus pallidus. This is a putamen. And this is amygdala. One, people, one 
the question is, you just told us, you know, amygdala is located is anterior to the head of hippocampus. Now you're showing that amygdala is located ahead of the head of hippocampus. And also you can see that what is the best landmark for you to resect to do your amygdalectomy, removal of the amygdala? What is the best landmark? Because there's no division, no sulcus that separate the globus pallidus and uh, superiorly to the amygdala inferiorly. The best landmark will be the optic tract over here. See, just by the level of optic tract, you can resect the uh, amygdala, okay? But if you can, you can ask me, I don't want to see optic tract, it's too dangerous. I don't want to see. Um, I might end up injuring global, uh, optic tract this way. You can do, I, this is what I, show, I will show you in the video. You can just follow the arachnoid membrane, follow, 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 follow uh, superiorly, and then all of a sudden, there's no more arachnoid membrane because it will reflect backwards towards the, uh, the optic tract. So if you follow the optic tract, at the end, superior end of the optic tract, you have reached, you have to reach the level of optic tract, okay? The superior end of the uncus, actually. So just follow the arachnoid membrane, you can get the same, uh, same result, let's say. Take on message, amygdala is the anterior wall of the temporal horn. Amygdala stays on top of the head of hippocampus. And the optic tract is the landmark to separate the globus pallidus from the amygdala. Internal capsule, it presents five parts. Anterior limb, the genu, this part, this part, and this part. So we can see that this part of internal capsule and this part of internal capsule are related to the temporal horn. So this, this gray matter structure is, is called the lensiform, obviously because of its shape. You can see the shape. This is a lens form of a lens. So fibers coursing underneath, below, the lensiform nucleus are called the sublenticular, sub means under, sublenticular part of the internal capsule. And this part, of the internal capsule that runs behind the lentiform nucleus is called the retro lentiform uh, part of the internal capsule. Okay, the main component of this uh, part of in retro lenticular or sublenticular part of internal capsule is optic radiation. So this is um, the most anterior part of uh, optic radiation is called the um, Mayer's loop. Is um, kind of variable depends on the a person, it can go more anteriorly or less anteriorly. The more anteriorly it goes, more chance to be injured during a surgery involved the temporal horn. So take home message, optic radiation constitutes part of the roof and the lateral wall of the temporal horn. And the optic radiation is part of sub and the rectal lenticular component of internal capsule. And the mayor's loop is the anterior part of the temporal horn with variable extent. The mesial temporal lobe is drained by the basal vein Rosenthal. Basal vein originates from the insula, the veins running in the south side of the insula, and then constitute in the sylvan fissure as a deep middle cerebral vein, and at the Interperforate under the interperforate substance, it will form the striate segment. So over here, striate segment, or the first segment of the basal vein. And from the tip of the uncus, you can see the tip of uncus, it will form the pedunculate segment. Why it's it is called pedunculate because it surrounds the peduncle. Okay, it's over here, and then at the level of the lateral mesencephalic sulcus, it will be called as a posterior mesencephalic segment. So here is, here is our inferior choroidal point where the inferior ventricular vein that drains the, through the roof of the temporal horn will join the uh, basal vein. And uh, the inferior ventricular vein at the inferior choroidal point will separate the the peduncular segment into an anterior and another posterior segment, posterior peduncular segment and anterior peduncular segment.
Okay, and then eventually they will drain most of the most of the cases drain drain towards the the um, vein of Galen here. Take on message: basal vein drains the medial temporal lobe region. It presents a striate segment, a pedunculate segment, and posterior mesencephalic segment. Arterial relationships: internal carotid artery here, middle cerebral artery here. Anterior carotid artery, we're going to see that later, and a posterior cerebral artery. They are all related to the uncus. This is a close up view. Internal carotid artery will be related to the anterior segment of uncus, and also the um, MCA will be related also to the anterior segment. The tip of the uncus will be related to the third nerve. We're going to see that later. This is the um, dissection, but in a real, real surgery, third nerve will run under the tip of the uncus. And PCA will be related to the posterior segment of the uncus. And here we have the anterior choroidal artery over here running into the inferior choroidal point. This is a third nerve running underneath the tip of the uncus. So this is the letter, uh, medial view of the anterior choroidal artery. And we can see that anterior choroidal artery is is running superiorly and posteriorly toward this point. Where's, what is this point? This is the inferior choroidal point. What is the message? Inferior choroidal point is the most superior and posterior aspect of the uncus. If you want to remove the uncus, if you want to remove the amygdala, you have to have the most anterior and superior part of the uncus, and you have the inferior choroidal point. So how can I get there? to this point. You can either follow the optic tract or you can follow the, the arachnoidal membrane. So this is the take home message. Inferior choroidal point is the most superior and posterior part of duncus. And the choroidal fissure separates thalamus from the fornix. Okay. And this is the PCA. So let's take a look, close up view of here. This branch and this branch, they are they have the same origin. This one goes between the thalamus and the fornix. So this is the lateral posterior choroidal artery. This one goes below the dente gyrus. This one is the hippocampal, gyru, uh, hippocamp hippocampal artery. Okay, take on message. Lateral posterior choroidal artery enter, arteries enter the choroidal fissure and the hippocampal arteries enter the hippocampal sulcus between the dente gyrus above and the parahippocampal gyrus below. Third nerve, this is a medial view of the third nerve and the uncus. What is the relationship between them? Between them? Third nerve runs right underneath the tip of the uncus. So the take home message, oculomotor nerve courses below the apex of the uncus. Now the surgery. So we're gonna see all over again, all those structures I have mentioned. I will show a very short video of the uh, modified anterior temporal lobectomy, okay? This is a positioning that I use for the, the removal of the mesotemporal lobe lesions um, from anteriorly. So you can see this is expo brain exposure for the mesotemporal lobe region, and this is the exposure for sylvan fissure, for instance, anterior circulation aneurysms. So I'm going to show quickly a case of 18-year-old female patient with um, focal onset impaired awareness seizures. We call usually call complex partial seizures since age 12. So the, pre the, the patient presents a mesotemporal lobe sclerosis on the right side. So. This is a surgery. Before saying that, my first question, before showing the video, where's the temporal horn? Can you tell me? So this is a very small superior temporal gyrus. This is a rather large middle temporal gyrus. So where's, where is the transition between, where's the pars triangularis here? That's, where, that's what the anatomy is all about. The pars is over here. The transition between pars opercular is over here. So the temporal horn will be projected down in this part of the brain. Okay? Okay. 
So now I'm peeling the superior temporal gyrus off the arachnoid membrane of the sylvan fissure until there is no more arachnoidal membrane, meaning that we have reached the inferior limiting sulcus of the insula. And now we are, uh, we are going through the temporal stem and reaching the temporal horn from above. This is a modified, the tip of a temporal globe has been removed. Now, this is the amygdala. Okay, amygdala is located ahead and above the tip, the head of hippocampus, which is here. And then I'm looking and showing you the inferior choroidal point, the origin, the beginning of the choroidal fissure. And then first step is the removal of the amygdala. How can I get there if I don't want to see the optic tract? You follow the arachnoidal membrane. You see this arachnoidal membrane all the way down there and all the way up to here. And then this is the middle MCA. This is MCA. And then arachnoid membrane will disappear from here. So you, all you have to do is to connect a line of the removal between the arachnoid membrane and the inferior choroidal point. And this is the removal of the amygdala and block. And then we go to the lateral part of hippocampus. This is the, this is a collateral sulcus. So we call this part as a lateral disconnection. By keeping the arachnoid membrane intact, you can preserve the inferior temporal arteries. Now I'm opening the choroidal fissure. This is the inferior choroidal point. I'm splitting, this is a fornix. This is a pendima that binds the choroidal plexus to the tinea, we call tinea fornices, okay? This is a lateral geniculate body. This is a thalamus. So we are splitting to separate what can be removed, which is the temporal lobe structure and from what we have to preserve, which is a thalamic structure on, the, uh, this, on this side of the, the suc suction tube. This is, I've been asked to get samples of um, Dente gyrus for uh, basic science. So I have to go underneath the, uh, the, um, underneath the furnace to get that. This is the inferior choroidal point once again. This is the last, the most posterior located gyrus of Duncus, which is the interlimbic. Okay, so we are at the interlimbic gyrus over here. Very careful because at this point, this is gonna be anterior choroidal artery entering the temporal horn. I'm working again on the lateral side and back again on the medial side of the hippocampus. And here we can see the PCA, P2, and uh, sending off hippocampal arteries, Uchimura's arteries, through the arachnoid membrane of hippocampus sulcus. So you have to coagulate and cut them, okay? For the lateral posterior choroid arteries, you have to preserve them. This is the you have to coagulate. This is a transverse hippocampal vein. You have to coagulate and cut. And then I'm cutting through the arachnoid membrane of the hippocampal um, sulcus. So one more hippocampal artery, you have to coagulate and cut. Underneath the hippocampal sulcus, this is gonna be the parahippocampal gyrus. So I'm working once again, laterally to the hippocampus, keeping intact the arachnoid membrane so we can see the inferior arteries, temporal arteries, would be all preserved if you keep the arachnoid membrane intact. And still working on the medial side of hippocampus, this is already the parahippocampal gyrus. If you keep the arachnoid intact, you protect the brain stem from the surgeon. Okay, so I'm going at most posterior aspect of hippocampus possible and disconnect it. So this is the uh, the removal of the hippocampus. This is a PCA, it's, this is a third nerve. If you see the third nerve, because the tip of apex of uncus was here. And this is the inferior choroidal point. This is the inferior ventricular vein draining the roof. This side, thalamus. This side, temporal lobe. Choroidal fish is a very important, is a very important landmark, intraoperative landmark. This is a post-op picture oculomotor nerve, you can see P P2, posterior cerebral artery, cruz cerebri, midbrain, and here it's gonna be pons. And another picture, inferior choroidal point, PCA, cruz cerebri, we are at the level of the tegumentum of the midbrain, okay? How do I know? I went to the lab, you can see the choroidal artery, 
you can see the third nerve going through the roof of the, the, the cavernous sinus, basilar artery. You can see in anterior choroidal artery, inferior choroidal point, PCA, crew cerebri, pons, fourth nerve, and so on. This is a povinar of the thalamus. Okay? This, is, this was the amygdala. This, this is already globus pallidus. Okay, this is the post-op. And um, I'm gonna stop here, but for mediotemporal lobe region, you can go from below, from behind. For instance, a lesion over here, you can go from behind. Just want to show you this, the, um, the, uh, the lesion over here. It's much easier. If you want, you want to just remove the lesion, you can go medial to the tentorium, the edge of the tentorium, you can go through the cerebellum, above the cerebellum to reach that, okay? I, I will not show them the video, but um, um, because of a time, but uh, we, we, can, we have time later to discuss. And I thank you so much for your patience, for your attention, and sorry for, I have been talking for 25 minutes, sorry for this. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Wen. Spectacular and, and also very practical as well. I'm sure people are finding this extremely practical as I can apply it to surgery. Um, okay, on to Jeff. So now we're going to switch gears. We, you've heard two spectacular brain parenchymal anatomy. So we're going to shift to skull base now. And Jeff is going to tell us why the sphenoid bone is the center of the skull base and what are its critical relational anatomical uh, facets. So Jeff, we're, uh, we're ready for you. So here it is, uh, okay. the intracranial facing features, the articulations of the ethmoid, the frontal bone, the squamosal, the petrosal, and the occipital bone. So you see it's surrounded by all the other skull base bones. So it, in a sense, it is sort of the center of the skull base, right? Uh, and here we see one of the partitions uh, between the frontal fossa and the sphenoid sinus, which is the plane of sphenoidale, of course. Posterior to that, centrally, we have the cella, which is uh, bounded uh, posteriorly by the dorsum cella, which is a partition that then leads to the posterior fossa, and interpendicular fossa area. And if we move laterally, we see the, the optic canal uh, and the cavernous sinus, which is uh, roofed by the anterior clinoid process, which also is a lateral border for the optic canal. So again, it's useful to think about these various spaces and their partitions. Um, and then in the middle fossa floor, we see uh, from in rotundum and ovale. So uh, even more complex, I think, is the extracranial facing feature. So this is uh, looking at the sphenoid bone from, from an anterior perspective. And you see the, uh, the, the face of the sphenoid sinus here. And then uh, it's going to articulate with the ethmoid bone. Um, you see the... Uh, Lamina propitia, which forms the medial wall of the orbit, and then behind that, the sphenoethmoid suture, which is then going to articulate with the face of the sphenoid. This is the anterior view of the ethmoid, and here's how it looks uh, uh, covering the, the face of the sphenoid uh, sinus. Um, and uh, you can see that it's somewhat of an obstruction to the sphenoid sinus, and that the nasal cavity is actually a very narrow corridor, and you can corridor, and you can open that wider by opening this ethmoid air cells. It's not much of an obstruction to say the pterygopalatine fossa down here, although the, the turbinate and some of the inferior air, air cells uh, may need to be mobilized to, to reach laterally here. And then the articulation with the frontal bone uh, is interesting. You see this very wide uh, suture here for the greater wing of the uh, sphenoid bone and then the lesser wing here. Uh, here's a view from above and, and here's the articulation. The lesser and greater wing are articulating as you saw there. And add the ethmoid bone back in. Now let's uh, move on to uh, some other bones that are articulating with the sphenoid. Uh, with a greater wing, we see the, the zygoma, uh, and then all that then uh, uh, articulates with the maxilla. And these three bones uh, form sort of a, a wrap around the inferior orbital fissure. So, uh, and then uh, ultimately the inferior orbital fissure is emptying into the pterygopalatine fossa back here. And you notice that the pterygopalatine fossa is uh, uh, partially obstructed by the maxillary sinus here, which lies under the orbital uh, floor, as we'll see later. And then another bone, let's add in more posteriorly, we've got the anterior hard palate. It's a palatine bone, which has a, 
vertical and horizontal plate and uh, you put them together here and they form uh, the, the posterior hard palate. There's an or orbital process which contributes a little bit to the, uh, the orbit and then you have this uh, sphenoid process which articulates with the, the base of the sphenoid body. Between these two you have the sphenopalatine foramen through which the IMAX and sphenopalatine artery uh, enter the, um, the nasal cavity. It's a major landmark for, for endonasal procedures. Uh, so this palatine bone is going to articulate here with a pterygoid process uh, and the base of the sphenoid. So that's what it looks like here. You see the palatine bone, the sphenopalatine foramen, the IMAX becoming sphenopalatine artery. And here are the three bones arranged, anteriorly the maxilla, and then further posteriorly the palatine, and finally the most uh, posterior in the nasal, nasal cavity and nasopharynx is, uh, in this picture, is the sphenoid bone. Uh, one more bone uh, to add, the vomer, uh, which Dr. Uh, Roten used to compare to a fish bone that he found on the beach. It articulates with the uh, rostrum of the sphenoid sinus. It forms the inferior part of the nasal septum, which articulates with the hard palate, as you see here, the palatine bone and the uh, maxilla. And here is the nasal septum, perpendicular plate of ethmoid, uh, the vomer, which is the best marker for midline if you're using an anatomical uh, marker. The, the upper part of the septum perpendicular plate can be deviated. Uh, and then you see the sphenoid, you see the opening to the uh, sphenoid sinus, this, and the, these two foramina can be opened, uh, say with a kerosene punch if you're doing a pituitary operation. Uh, you see laterally that sphenopalatine uh, foramen like we talked about before, and that uh, sphenoid process of the palatine bone. Uh, so uh, one thing let's uh, look at a little bit more detail uh, with your x-ray vision is you should be able to imagine what's behind the, the maxillary sinus here. You know, we talked about earlier how it's covering up the sphenopalatine, uh, uh, pterygopalatine fossa and the infratemporal fossa. So let's look at that. How would we access those? Well, you could go straight through the maxillary sinus uh, anteriorly and then go through the back wall of the maxillary sinus and you see that pterygoid process and pterygopalatine fossa and then you see the infratemporal fossa there. So uh, that's one way to get there. The other way would, to, uh, would be an expanded endonasal approach, which you see here. Here, here you see the, the back wall, the, the maxillary sinus here, a little bit of palatine uh, bone. And then on this side, you see the, the pterygoid process. Uh, the back wall, the maxillary sinus has been removed. The palatine bone has been removed. And you see the pterygoid process, pterygopalatine fossa, and the infratemporal fossa just lateral to that. So you can access. Uh, these off line structures uh, through either a direct through the maxillary sinus approach or through an endonasal approach. And then here's another view of that uh, maxillary sinus wall posteriorly with some palatine bone here medially and then the hole we made in the back of the wall to see uh, the pterygoid process and pterygopalatine fossa. And that's probably the most mysterious uh, compartment I think uh, related to the sphenoid bone, at least it was for me when I was learning this Here's another way to look at it. If you're looking at from an infralateral approach, you see the greater wing of the sphenoid, and then below that, the pterygoid process pointing um, downwards in the infratemporal fossa here. Uh, the, the greater wing is the temporal fossa where the temporalis muscle lives, the infratemporal fossa here. And then uh, the, the, the maxillary sinus is here. And then this little cleft between those two, it's a very narrow uh, uh, space, is that pterygopalatine fossa. And this, uh, as we mentioned earlier, communicates with the infraorbital fissure uh, above. So these compartments all communicate infratemporal fossa, pterygopalatine fossa, infraorbital fissure, temporal fossa, um, all spaces that the sphenoid bone helps uh, define. And another uh, pearl with this uh, uh, pterygoid process is that if you're doing a percutaneous rhizotomy and you're heading for the uh, uh, foramen valley, it's this bone that you often run into with your needle before you find uh, what you're looking for. So the orbit, again, is a, a, an interesting place where a lot of these bones come together. You see the frontal bone or articulated with the lesser and greater sphenoid wings, and you see uh, the optic canal uh, bounded by the optic strut laterally and the anterior clinoid process laterally and superiorly. And then you see the superior orbital foramen between the lesser sphenoid wing and the greater sphenoid wing, which then uh, uh, articulates with the zygoma and the maxilla. Uh, and then those three form that inferior, orbit, in, inferior oral fissure, which we talked about before, and the lacrimal and ethmoid bone. The ethmoid bone articulates with the body of the sphenoid right here. So uh, let's start using our x-ray vision this, from different perspectives. Let's start out with lateral perspective. And you want to imagine the bone, then you want to imagine the soft tissues in front of the bone and beyond. 
in the spaces that are defined. So you have the greater sphenoid wing, which is going to define a temporal fossa here for the temporalis fossil, the infratemporal fossa below. Uh, and then your anterior climate process, which we, again, roof of cavernous sinus, dorsum cella, which is the posterior border of the cella, and is a partition that you can remove to access the posterior fossa and interpenicular fossa and basilar apex area. So uh, the clearing off, exposing the lateral sphenoid is easy. You mobilize the temporalis muscle and you have the greater wing of the sphenoid. Um, uh, typically, if you're doing this, you're doing a pterion of craniotomy. And the pterion is basically where uh, these bones come together, the frontal, parietal, squamosal, temporal, and the greater wing of the sphenoid. And uh, if, if you want to get additional exposure, you can remove uh, part of the zygoma bone, as you'll see. Uh, a particular interest is a frontal sphenoid suture because if you make a burr hole, burr hole here, you'll be able to access the orbital roof. And so you can get a dura and periorbita on either side of the orbital roof. And so you can do a, a craniotomy and an orbitotomy, which is nice for your FTOZ. So this frontal sphenoid suture is important, an important feature. And uh, that burr hole would lead to the orbitotomy here. So you do your uh, terrional craniotomy uh, by drilling down the sphenoid, you get this sort of exposure. But if you access the infra inferior orbital fissure and go ahead and take off the whole uh, greater sphenoid wing and the zygoma, you get much better exposure as you see here with an FTOZ. So now that the greater wing is out of the way, let's talk about what other sphenoid bone uh, features we might want to deal with, and that's the anterior clonal process. You see that roof of cavernous sinus, and it's, it, access, it allows you to access the optic canal, the carotid artery, and again, the cavernous sinus. So uh, uh, if you want to go even further, you can remove the posterior clonal process and some of the dorsum cella to do a transcavernous approach to the basilar apex and get even more exposure. Here's what that would look like. So the anterior clonal process has been removed. We've opened up the oculomotor cistern by cutting the dura to get the oculomotor nerve exposed. And here you see the posterior cella, and this is the typical transcavernous approach. You can skeletonize around the fourth nerve to get even lower. Uh, so. Uh, that's uh, the, the lateral type approach. Now let's look at the anterior anatomy and use our x-ray vision here. Um, so again, uh, the sphenoid sinus lies here, superior order fissure between the lesser and the greater sphenoid uh, wings. And uh, we saw that this uh, forms the lateral wall that orbit earlier, uh, another space outside the temporal fossa. And then you have your pterygoid process, uh, which helps define this pterygopalatine fossa uh, through which V2 and Vidian pass and then the infratemporal fossa uh, below. So let's uh, add all the flesh uh, and, and uh, we can see the outline of the, the sphenoid bone here. I think this is just a beautiful dissection. And uh, so let's correlate what we uh, see with the bony anatomy and the, and the soft tissue anatomy. There's our nasal cavity and the eustachian tube. The process, if you're gonna go off midline and deep, you have to deal with the eustachian tube. Here's your sphenoid sinus centrally, and the, 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 the lateral wall of the sphenoid sinus here, along with the um, uh, greater wing and lesser wing, surrounds the orbital apex, as you see here. And the orbital apex, if you uh, follow it backwards, you'll see the superorbital fissure, which the uh, nerves uh, from the cavernous sinus empty into, and of course, your optic canal through which the uh, optic nerve emerges. Below the uh, superorbital fissure, again, the pterygo. Uh, pterygoid process and pterygopalatine fossa, as we saw before with V2 and Vidian. The infratemporal fossa with the pterygoid muscles, uh, IMAX, which becomes uh, sphenopalatine artery and V3 branches. So here's the face of the sphenoid sinus. You'll see that it's uh, um, um, accessible through the nasal cavity centrally, but laterally you have these ethmoid air cells that are covering it. So you can get more exposure by removing those. And then lateral to the ethmoids, of course, the orbital apex. And then if you know your x-ray vision, you can see that the maxillary sinus, the back wall, is going to lead to the pterygopalatine process, as we saw before. So looking at the features of the uh, sphenoid sinus, uh, uh, you'll know that there are impressions for the pituitary um, gland, the carotid arteries, and these are uh, variable, uh, the optic canal and the optic carotid recess, through, which is a pneumatized uh, optic strut, uh, which is variable as well and the tuberculum cella if you want more uh, superior exposure to, to expose the supercellular contents. Uh, we've also uh, drilled away some bones to see the basilar sinus uh, posteriorly and the cavernous sinus laterally. If we want to look off midline, uh, look laterally, you see 
um, the carotid artery, it's important to understand that the carotid artery is vertical and it's paraclival. So when you're drilling the dorsum cella and the, and the clivus, uh, be aware that the carotid is nearby. And then it turns forward, as you all know, and then turns backwards to the clinoidal segment and then the supraclinoidal segment. Into uh, looking from a medial perspective into the sphenoid sinus. And now we can uh, go below and drill the pterygoid uh, base. And so and that'll allow us to uh, expose the bidian nerve in its canal, which leads to the carotid artery as it exits the petrous apex, uh, V2 going through foramen rotundum. And you see the oculomotor uh, V1 and the abducens nerve here. So if we keep drilling through this bone off midline, uh, that's the spiral fissure, the sympathetics, uh, if we keep drilling off of midline, we can expose uh, the carotid even more extensively uh, following the median nerve back to the, the petrous apex, as Juan Carlos will talk about more later. Then you see the abducens V1 and the cavernous sinus V2 and V3. So you can actually get all the way into Meckel's cave and middle fossa by drilling off midline. So let's go below the orbit again and, and look at this pterygopalthian fossa in a little bit more detail as this appears opposed to your wall of the um, maxillary sinus, remove that, you see the uh, the pterygopalthian fossa uh, with V2, Vidian, uh, and its ganglion, uh, IMAX, terminating its phenopalthian artery. And uh, if we remove these pterygoid processes, our x-ray vision will tell us that we're going to get back to the infratemporal fossa here laterally. If we keep drilling, we can expose the carotid and the petrous bone. Uh, and uh, here's your cavernous sinus, V2 and V3, and the Vidian nerve there. So and again, Juan Carlos will tell you more about that in his lecture. So looking at it from above, let's, let's try to use our x-ray vision from above. Again, we want to be able to see from all angles and understand the anatomy. Uh, again, we see the cella, the planum, the lesser wing, anterior clinoid, optic nerves, chiasmatic, sulcus, tuberculum cella. And then there's a middle clinoid, which sometimes forms a ring with the anterior clinoid process, which you have to be careful about if you're removing the clinoid. Dorsum cella with the posterior clinoids. And then we have this uh, lingual process here of the sphenoid, which hugs the carotid artery as it exits the petrous apex and uh, uh, enters its cavernous segment in, uh, along the, the clivus, the paraclival segment. And the median canal, which takes you back to that area where the carotid is ex exiting the petrous apex. So another thing that has to be mentioned when you're talking about the sphenoid sinus is the mini dural attachments. You see that the, the edge of the tentorium is, uh, extends all the way to the anterior clinoid process here and it covers the optic nerve with the falciform ligament, which is continuous with this dura. Here's a, also a ligament that goes from the petrous apex over to the posterior clinoid and an interclinoidal segment of dura that forms this oculomotor triangle. So if I remove that dura, I get to the cavernous sinus and its contents. You see the supraclinoidal carotid, and this is the clinoidal uh, segment of the carotid, which is formed uh, by uh, the dura which is covered by the dura that envelops the, the interclinoid process. So once you remove the clinoid, you have dura left behind on this segment of the carotid artery with a proximal ring, which is a roof of the cavernous sinus and, and a distal ring, uh, which uh, uh, demarcates the super, superclinoid segment and cavernous sinus here and cavernous carotid here. Uh, zoom up of that. Okay, now let's get a posterior view. Uh, again, this is that Vidian canal, which is an important view uh, of important feature of the posterior part of the sphenoid bone. And then this is that sulcus where the carotid artery is leaving the petrous apex and entering the cavernous segment and ascending to, be, to form this paraclival segment. And then here, that lingual process, which uh, holds the carotid into this groove, right? So here are uh, the soft tissue features that have been added. Uh, again, uh, use our x-ray vision to go through the layers. Uh, peeling the layers off gradually. One thing to note is you have a ring of sinuses around the cella here, your basilar sinus behind, your inferior petrosal sinus, anterior intracavernous sinus, uh, the superior one here. And these all communicate with each other uh, variably. Your cavernous carotid as viewed from posterior. And again, the anterior part of the cavernous sinus is roofed by that clinoid process, the anterior clinoid process. Finally, from below, um, we see um, uh, the sphenoid bone as it articulates for the other bones. And this is one of the, the harder areas, or last area I, I really understood, but I think it uh, deserves a little attention. Um, you'll see that the pterygoid process is, uh, if you're coming from an endonasal approach, the pterygoid process is a barrier uh, 
uh, somewhat to reaching the infratemporal fossa over here or the petrous apex back here. So if you drill away this uh, pterygoid process, you, you, you clear the path uh, towards your, your, your petrous apex. So let's add, uh, and there, there's your frame of the serum, which you'll hear about later. So let's add some of the, uh, the, the soft tissue in. This is uh, where the pterygoid process has been drilled away. And uh, we followed the Vidian canal back. And you see nicely how this Vidian canal leads us straight to uh, the petrous, the, the exiting of the petrous carotid into uh, the cavernous segment. So uh, that's an important relationship. And then uh, you can, if you wanted to get adventurous, you could go uh, all the way back towards the jugular foramen. Again, both of these are embedded in the temporal bone, which Maria is going to tell you more about later. And then I think it's important to point out the eustachian tube here. Again, it's passing behind uh, the petrous, um, I mean, the uh, pterygoid process, and anterior to the carotid artery here. Um, and so uh, oftentimes for, for these type of approaches where you're going off midline, you'll need to deal with that. Uh, so I'm going to stop here. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions later on. It looks like my time is up. And uh, appreciate the opportunity to uh, present to you today. That's great. Jeff really shows very well what an important uh, uh, role the sphenoid bone has in the center of the skull bases. So much material. I'm sure our audience uh, will be thinking about all these details. So now, perfect segue to, for Juan to tell us, Juan Carlos, to tell us about the foramen lacero. Juan, it's all yours. Thanks, Jax. Uh, thanks again for the invitation and for your kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be among friends tonight. Um, so uh, my disclosures first, the royalties for this dissectors I designed with KLS Martin. I want to start acknowledging, of course, uh, my mentors, the mentors of many of us, Professor Rotten, Professor Evandro, their inspiration to translate things from the OR into the, from the lab to the OR, go from the OR to the lab to keep learning and getting better at what we do. And what I want to show you today is, you know, how the foramen lacerum has become, at least for me and for my practice, such a key landmark to, you know, actually operate on the skull base. It really becomes a very important aspect of, of, of what I do. And I want to share with you why. First, what is the foramen lacerum? The foramen lacerum is the gap that we have left after the incomplete confluence of three skull base bones, sphenoid bone, clival bone, or occipital bone, and petrous bone. They come together and they form a gap because there is no, they don't have a complete confluence. You know, this was studied in the past by the Cincinnati group, uh, Dr. Keller, a phenomenal anatomist, uh, and he titled this very nicely as the enigmatic foramen lacerum. This was 20 years ago. You can look at the comments. Uh, someone said, you know, in my opinion, it has no importance. It's not useful as a landmark during any cranial base operation. This was 20 years ago, not, not such a long time ago. Uh, and, you know, the point is that, you know, for transcranial operations, the foramen lacerum is really hidden you know, below the carotid um, and below the trigeminal nerve. So it really is very difficult to get access there unless you have a large tumor like a chondrosarcoma perhaps that give you access. So it's really an area that is not really exposed with a transcranial approach. However, with endonasal skull base approaches as they are developed, we realized that the foramen lacerum is such a key structure because it's at the crossroad of multiple, multiple anatomical areas. We can use it to as a starting point to all these areas, carotid canal, cavernous sinus, middle fossa, jugular foramen, uh, lower clivus, uh, petrous apex. All these areas are have in common the foramen lacerum at the center of, of them all. That's why, you know, I spent a lot of time working with my fellows. This was at the University of Pittsburgh trying to understand the foramen lacerum better. Uh, its anatomy and especially how to expose it, because at that time for me, it was really difficult um, technically to expose the carotid at the foramen lacerum endonasally is not an easy thing to do. There were other groups studying, including myself years before this area, and none of them, in my opinion, none of these previous studies get to the key point that I'm going to show you today. And that's why I think what I'm going to share with you today is, is, a, is a new concept and is mostly based on this pterygosphenoidal fissure. If you look at the foramen lacerum, it's the confluence not really of three bones, but of three fissures. The petroclival fissure, 
as you can see right here, the petrosphenoidal fissure right here, and this other fissure, which is often forgotten, which is called the pterygosphenoidal fissure between the pterygoid bone and the sphenoid bone. This is a basal view of the skull. This is a posterior view of the skull. Here you can see the Vidian canal opening into the foramen lacerum, the posterior aspect of the Vidian canal. And this line here is the pterygosphenoidal fissure. As you see, of course, it opens directly into the foramen lacerum because it forms part of it, uh, a very important part of it. And also there was another interesting thing we, we also described here. This bone right here between the fissure and the Vidian canal is called the pterygoid tubercle. And this is not a name I invented. This is a name that was given a century ago described in Grey's Anatomy. The thing is, it had no surgical use until these days. Pterygoid tubercle, as you will see, is something we need to remove to expose the carotid in the foramen lacerum. So we studied this in CT scans, for example, and we realized that the Vidian canal and the pterygoid fissure, which you actually always see a little bit of it in the CT scan with its fine cut, uh, they have a 45 degree angle. And this is also important. But you only see a little bit of the pterygosphenoidal fissure and a lot of the canal because the fissure goes from an inferior to superior trajectory. As you will see here in this dissection, this fissure goes from inferior to superior in, an, in, an, in another angle with the Vidian canal. So this is a 3D, it's, like a, it's not a triangle of the skull base, it's a pyramid of the skull base where one side is the Vidian nerve, the other side is the fissure coming, the both confluence at the foramen lacerum. Based on this anatomy, you know, my technique to expose the foramen lacerum sometimes at the, at the, at the very first of the operation of the, of the approach is to drill on each side of the pterygoid fissure and to skeletonize this fissure so I can get all the way to the foramen lacerum. So I drill on one side on the pterygoid body, I drill on the other side on the floor of the sphenoid, and as you keep going deeper and deeper, you start seeing this fibrous tissue, which is the pterygoid fissure. Again, don't forget it runs from inferior to superior. And this landmark is much better than the median nerve because it is more medial and you can follow it directly to the, to the, uh, to the foramen lacerum itself. So here you see how it looks at the end. When you have done all this exposure, you can see here the uh, pterygoid tubercle has been removed. The pterygoid tubercle is that piece of bone that is at the end what remains between the median canal, the median nerve and the fissure. You have pterygoid tubercle, pterygoid fissure, median nerve. This is the anatomy you need to expose to get to the foramen lacerum and to expose the carotid safely, successfully um, as needed. We also describe you know, the different walls of the foramen lacerum. This is like Dr. Rotten tried to understand and describe different walls and different compartments, etc. So I like to understand what is around this foramen lacerum. There is a medial wall, which is between the pterygoid fissure and the petroclabal fissure. So all this bone needs to be removed to go to the petrous apex. Then we have a lateral wall here, which is the lingual process. And then as you go lateral, you have foramen ovale. Foramen ovale and foramen lacerum are at the same uh, uh, um, anteroposterior plane. They are, the foramen ovale is just lateral to the foramen lacerum. That's the depth of the foramen lacerum. But in between them, there is a bony process, which another strut we described, which is the mandibular strut between V3 and Vidian canal or V3 and lacerum segment. And then there is an inferior wall, which is the eustachian tube, which sometimes we need to detest so we can get access to the inferior aspect of the petrous apex, uh, the floor of the petrous apex. Um, and here you see that posterior wall, as we remove the eustachian tube or we uh, uh, mo mobilize the eustachian tube, we can get this petroclaval fissure lower aspect inferiorly and posteriorly. Okay, so based on this, we describe our technique for the uh, trans approach and also the trans lacerum approach. What happens is as you expose the uh, fissure, the reverse fissure, you can actually transect the fissure and this frees up the corroded of the foramen lacerum and allows us you, allows us you to get into the petrous apex superiorly, the jugular frame and inferiorly. You see the sixth nerve at the top of the petrous apex. You can see the inferior petrosal sinus at the beginning of the most ventral aspect of the jugular foramen. So I'm gonna show you a few cases where this uh, anatomy is very well illustrated. Most classical case where this is important is chondrosarcomas. In my opinion, chondrosarcomas are tumors that are almost always ideal for an endoscopic endonasal approach because of their location. 
the epicenter of these tumors is the foramen lacerum and the extent towards the upper pituitary fissure or the lower or both. Here you can see the median canal or the median nerve, all nicely skeletonized. And here I'm exposing the fissure, drilling the bone, making it thinner. This is the carotid canal. And note that I have not yet ex exposed any of the carotid artery in the paraclevel segment. I start from inferior. Once I find the fissure, I can very easily start unroofing the carotid just at the foramen lacerum. And this makes the complete skeletonization of the carotid really simple because now I can just go with my carison up and very easily expose the whole carotid. The most difficult part for me is been always the foramen lacerum, but with this technique, this actually has become quite simple. That's the median canal. We are quoting the median nerve. And now I'm uh, trying to remove the uh, foramen, the uh, pterygoid tubercle, so it can get a bit lower access on the carotid. And then you can see V2 prominence here. If you need, you can keep going lateral to find the lingual process here and the mandibular strat, always using a Doppler to uh, control the location of the carotid. And this is a key move for this condosarcomas. We now transect the pterygoid fissure, and this separates the carotid from the eustachian tube. It preserves the eustachian tube, so I can mobilize it inferolaterally, but it still is patent. And I can then access the lower aspect of the petroclaval fissure where the condosarcoma is extending. Petrocobal fissure, as you know, opens up in the jugular foramen, and that's where I'm going. You see this piece of bone moving here is what is left of the floor of the sphenoid. And as I remove that, I'm in the petroclaval fissure. And what you see, the petroclaval fissure is, of course, full of tumor. You see how beautiful this tumor is? It's so anatomical. It's all within this petroclaval fissure. And what, we, what we're doing is just surrounding the tumor. We haven't removed any tumor yet. We want to completely expose the tumor, and only at the end, we start sucking the tumor out. We're just opening our access again into the inferior petroclaval fissure, and now extending this a bit more lateral by removing the lingual process, so I can uh, sort of mobilize the carotid a little bit more. But this is the key access that, keeps, uh, that provides uh, you know, access to the whole pitus carotid. You can see now, I mean, the, inside the pitus bone, seeing the whole pitus carotid all the way to the posterior aspect where it enters the uh, temporal bone. And, uh, you know, this is the uh, key to remove all tumor in the petrous apex and into the uh, jugular uh, foramen. Now, other examples. Now I'm going to give you an example of going from the foramen lacerum up towards the petrous apex and cavernous sinus. This is an example of a uh, uh, clival cordoma. So this tumor that you see right here is in the cavernous sinus, posterior clinoids, um, extending towards Meckel's cave here. So it's a recurrent, previously operated invasive tumor, but my operation starts very much at the foramen lacerum, as you will see. And that's a very important first step. So um, as we see here, this vidian nerve, this pterygoid fissure we drill in between. Then I remove the medial wall of the foramen lacerum between the pterygoid fissure and the petroclaval fissure behind. I'm coagulating now the pterygoid fissure. And this bone here, this is the pterygoid tubercle, which I'm removing so I can fully expose the foramen lacerum, what is called the anterior wall of the foramen lacerum. And then lateral uh, along the nerve, the next thing I'm going to find is going to be the mandibular strut at the base of the lingual process. And then the next thing will be foramen ovale. So I have all this anatomy in my mind when I'm doing these approaches, what I have on lateral, what I have medial, in front, behind, etc. This is my approach. And now from here, this becomes much easier. I can remove this, uh, what is called the petrosal process of the sphenoid bone. That is what is left of the sphenoid just before getting to the petroclaval fissure. And then now I can open the cavernous sinus and go into the cavernous sinus and take tumor from there. And I'm just going to skip it. And then I'm, I complete a tumor resection in this case. I don't want to show you the whole case. I'm just going to show you the key aspect of exposing the foramen lacerum. And we can do it for condosarcomas that extend both, like this very nice uh, case that extends on the upper petroclaval fissure and cavernous sinus into the lower petroclaval fissure and, and jugular foramen. We can remove all this tumor. The epicenter is the foramen lacerum, and we can remove it completely through an endonasal approach. Another area where this becomes very important is for lower clival tumors. 
meningiomas, or like this case, a very unique case that I did recently, it looks like a meningioma, but it's a 13 year old that presents with ringing in the ears. Uh, that's it. Uh, as you see, it's a tumor in the lower clivus. And if you look at the T2 is very dark, which is very concerning, but also you look at this pituclaval fissure, pituscorotid, so this is the foramen lacerum. So to really have a good exposure of this tumor, you need to expose the uh, jugular, the, the foramen lacerum. It's very important. So the foramen lacerum is going to be exposed at the beginning of the operation. Here what we're doing is a uh, transverse approach and then find the pterygoid fissure right here. So drill sphenoid sinus floor on one side, pterygoid body on the other side. I didn't mention, but this case had a biopsy before, and this was a meningeal melanocytoma, very rare pathology. But you see how this fibrous tissue, pterygoid sphenoid fissure, takes me directly to the carotid and makes very safe uh, in a stepwise fashion the exposure of the uh, carotid artery. And that's the key to do a wide clivectomy for this complex tumor and just going all the way to the end to show you um, this was a uh, very difficult tumor. It was extremely calcified. Um, but at the end, we did a near complete resection of this tumor, leaving some little pieces of tumor stuck to periphery and vessels in the brainstem, a patient with a uh, with, uh, great outcome and intact, uh, no, no deficits, some tumor that we are going to approach to a retro sigmoid approach in the near future. So just to finish two examples on adenomas, you know, who would think that you need to understand the foramen lacerum to do pituitary surgery, but you actually do, you know, we describe the compartments of the cavernous sinus. When you go to the inferior compartment and the posterior compartment of the cavernous sinus, it is very important to understand the foramen lacerum because you see, you see a tumor like this, this patient has acromegaly. And you look at here and the tumor is at the foramen lacerum almost. You look at here, the tumor is at the foramen lacerum almost. And in this tumor, you need to be very aggressive with your cervical resection. You cannot leave any residual tumor if you are aiming for a surgical cure in this case, which in the past, I would think I was not able to do, but now I can do a more aggressive operation and I can get a better chance of a surgical remission in a case like this. You see my operation again is starting low in the foramen lacerum. Eustachian tube is down here, median nerve, I transected, but I'm following the stump and I see this white tissue here is the pterygoesphenoidal fissure. And I'm getting all the way to the pterygoid tubercle. And after I remove the pterygoid tubercle, I'm gonna have the red access and exposure of the carotid artery at the foramen lacerum, as you see right there. So all above is tumor, but for me, it's key to expose the carotid in the foramen lacerum before I actually go into the cell and I start removing tumor. Then come several you know, hours of careful dissection. This is a tumor that is embedded completely in the medial wall. And I need to carefully transect all these ligaments. Uh, you see this is the specimen at the end, thickness of the medial wall attached to the carotid artery. At the end, the whole carotid is being skeletonized right here. All segments of the carotid artery in the cavernous sinus have been exposed. That's cleaning up the clinoidal space. Superior compartment up here. We are cleaning it up. This is inferior compartment. This is posterior compartment. All of it, and this is the foramen lacerum right here. And the dura is streamed right above the foramen lacerum. And um, again, we start the operation with that exposure. This patient had an IGF-1 at two months normalized and an immediate post-op growth hormone level of 0.1. So he's in, he's in complete remission at this point. And my last case is this other very invasive adenoma. This patient has Cousin's disease, very invasive very severe Cousin's disease, this young lady. And the tumor, you see supracellular space through the oculomoral triangle into the cavernous sinus, both sides perhaps, but also into the clivus, the pine clival, and also in the foramen lacerum, both sides. So this is another operation that um, I believe understanding the foramen lacerum is a key part of the operation and is actually usually a starting point. You can see how this tumor is surrounding the carotid at, at the level of the foramen lacerum and towards the petrous apex. And uh, then we proceed with our operation to remove this tumor. So again, I'm uh, drilling here to expose first the carotid of the foramen lacerum, a little bit quicker. And uh, you see, but the same anatomy, I'm following the pterygospheroidal fissure. This bone here is very soft because it's embedded by tumor. On the other side, pterygospheroidal fissure, same thing. Bone is soft, I can just remove it. Completely skeletonize the carotid. 
once I have both crotids exposed at the foramen laserum, now I feel much better. I can just follow it up and escalatorize the whole cavern of sinus all the way to the clonidal segment and do my uh, tumor resection. In this case, cutting the pterygosphenoidal fissure also because there is tumor behind towards the petrous apex. What you see bleeding there is the inferior petrosal sinus drilling towards the jugular tubercle because this tumor is very invasive. Again, this is a tumor where I'm gonna aim for a surgical cure. This looks like a true challenge to get a surgical cure in this patient, but we are moving medial wall of the cavernous sinus in this side. We're gonna go to the other cavernous sinus and I'm gonna expedite this. And at the end, look at this beauty. This tumor is going through the oculomotor triangle. You can see the third nerve, the PCAM, the uh, corridorium perforating vessels, the basilar, the uh, uh, pituitary stalk and the carotid and the uh, pituitary are displaced to the right side. And uh, this is the sixth nerve here and the canal that I'm escalatonizing and removing tumor around the canal on top of the petrosal process. And then this is the reconstruction just with an inferior lateral nasal wall flap because the patient had a previous operation somewhere else where the septum was uh, damaged. And this patient, unbelievable for me actually, got C crashed, her cortisol levels was 2.1 and uh, she's in surgical remission. She got a six nerve palsy post-op that is partial, uh, but an intact third nerve and, and an excellent outcome. So with this, I hope to illustrate the importance of the foramen lacerum and how this understanding takes you to so many places in the skull base when you access them through a ventral approach, such as the endonasal approach. And to me, it's really been a game changer. And I think it has improved the outcomes of the cases I do, as you see on those very invasive uh, adenomas. I wanna end up by thanking my uh, team in the lab who uh, put some of these dissections together. They're doing phenomenal work. And my surgical team at Stanford with whom I do all these uh, complex uh, cases. Thank you very much for your attention. Fantastic one, really nice, really, really nice. Um, we'll, we'll come back to questions uh, at the end after Maria's talk. Thank you. Thank Maria, you. Take, take us to one of the most complex bones in the body, really the temporal bone uh, that is uh, often misunderstood or poorly understood by neurosurgeons. And tell us what neurosurgeons need to know about it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation. It's really a privilege for me to be here. And uh, I hope we can uh, get this started. Do you see everything okay? Yes, it looks great. Okay, wonderful, thank you. So, uh, so it's a little bit of a challenge to put together, you know, one of the most complex bone and its relationships with, you know, other structures in the skull base in relationship with the brain and how it relates to the different surgical approaches. So that's what I'm going to try to summarize in this talk about trying to unlock the secrets within the rock, within the temporal bone. And all this anatomy can, is very complex and this just illustrates uh, if the temporal bone is here and I, I drilled part of that temporal bone in that dissection, how many you know, different and complex anatomical structures we need to know about in order to access through the temporal bone or around the temporal bone uh, for our surgical approaches. So just let's start with, as Dr. Rotten said, with the basics of oste osteology. And this is our temporal bone. And, you know, it's junction posteriorly, that's the asterion with the parietal bone and the occipital bone. And anteriorly with the sphenoid bone as Dr. Uh, Sorensen was talking about. And really where the posterior fossa is, is in between the zygomatic arch and the inion. So a relatively small space as compared to the rest of the intracranial space. And what other structures we can uh, uh, estimate are, you know, related to the temporal bone are the transverse uh, sinus and then the sigmoid sinus following the degastric group here. And then the jugular bulb, we cannot, it's variable in height. So it can be a high jugular bulb, a medium or a low jugular bulb. It depends on the particular anatomy of the patient. So going posteriorly to see what kind of anatomical relationships we have. Again, the asterion is here, 
that's the temporal bone, the parietal bone, and the occipital bone, posterior fossa, and here the digastric groove, where we said that more or less can estimate where the sigmoid sinus descends uh, through the skull base. So a superior view of where the temporal bone sits in the skull base, that's the sphenoid bone, that's the occipital bone. And we see the junction and the articulation between these two bones and then the posterior aspect of the petrous bone, the petrous part of the temporal bone articulating with the occipital bone in the medial aspect of it, the petroclival fissure that opens posteriorly to form the jugular foramen, which is not really a true foramen, but it is in the junction between these two bones. And putting some of the structures together, this is the temporal bone. And we know that we are going to find many structures in the middle fossa, many structures in the posterior fossa, and the petrous part of the temporal bone is going to be surrounded by all the different uh, venous and at atomical structures, the superior petrosal sinus, the inferior petrosal sinus, the, sac the transverse sigmoid junction, and going here towards the jugular bulb or the jugular vein that will be here. So isolating the temporal bone first, so we'll look at the zygomatic process, this is the squamosal part of the temporal bone. And then we have the mastoid part, the tympanic part that forms the posterior aspect of the EAC, the styloid part of this, the styloid process. And then this is an inferior view of the right temporal bone. This is the petrous part of the temporal bone, petrous apex. And again, the squamosal part, styloid, and mastoid portions that we can see here. This is a superior view of two isolated temporal bones. And this is anterior and this is posterior. So we see the, the empty gap of the uh, occipital bone. And we see that this is the petrous ridge right here, which separates, you know, this is the middle fossa and this is the posterior fossa. And it's also uh, where we see this groove. This groove is for the superior petrosal sinus and also where the tentorium attaches. And it's very important to recognize some of the uh, impressions and uh, depressions on the petrous ridge. It's gonna help us for surgery. The first one is a depression, is the trigeminal depression or impression that is where the fifth nerve goes uh, the fifth nerve goes right over that into Meckel's cave. And then we have the trigeminal prominence right after that. And then the meatal depression. And we see here the uh, represented the seven and eighth cranial nerves. This is the IAC. And then we'll see another elevation uh, that corresponds to the level of the arcuate eminence, which we can find in the middle fossa here. And then we see the area of another depression that corresponds to the tegment tympani. So this is the right side medial aspect of the temporal bone. And we see again the trigeminal impression or depression, trigeminal elevation, and then meatal depression corresponding to the IAC and the elevation corresponding to the arcuate eminence in the Peters Ridge, and then a depression that corresponds also posteriorly to the tegment tympani. And here is very nice, uh, it's a very nice picture to illustrate the IAC medially, which uh, has the, the transverse crest and the vertical crest or wheels bar. And we see the hiatus for the facial, cochlear, superior vestibular and inferior vestibular. Another structure that is very important here is the subarcuit fossa where the subarcuit artery goes to and ends blinding to the dura and that can be safely coagulated during surgery. So this is the anterior uh, view of the temporal bone and we are looking directly at the petrous apex and we see the uh, superior mm, foramen for the carotid, petrous carotid artery and the hiatus of the tensor tympani and the station two. So looking at the petrous apex and the petrous part of the temporal bone, 
from below and anterior, that's the right side. So we see here represented the ascending and horizontal portion of the Peters carotid. This is the Peters apex, the inferior petrosal sinus, the jugular vein, and here represented the tensor tympani and the eustachian tube. Another representation looking at the venous structures on the posterior aspect of the petrous part of the temporal bone, superior petrosal sinus, inferior petrosal sinus, and then the sigmoid sinus posteriorly. And now a posterior view, that's the one that we needed now uh, with the mastoid part and the styloid process, the stylomastoid foramen will be here for the facial nerve and the zygomatic process of the temporal bone. And here's just a view of the tympanic part of the temporal bone. And then this is the spine of Henle, just inferior and posterior to the root of this, posterior aspect of the root of the zygoma. And this will be more or less the level where we are going to find the facial nerve in the transmastoid approaches. A superior view of the temporal bone. And now we're gonna get into uh, the surgical anatomy of uh, as related to the temporal bone and some an approach that is part, partially going through uh, the posterior aspect of the mastoid part of the temporal bone, that's the retrosigmoid approach and purely transtemporal approaches, the presigmoid approach uh, with its extensions, retrolab, translab, transcochlear. And then we are going to also go through uh, or over part of the temporal bone with the middle fossa approach. And this approach can be combined with the, pre the presigmoid approach and, the, and we can divide the tent and access a wide uh, variety of pathologies in the ventral skull base. So just this is a, a picture just to illustrate the attachment of the tentorium in the Peter's Ridge and how it can access through the middle fossa, laterally through the transmastoid approaches and retrosigmoid approaches. This is the attachment again of the tentorium. And uh, this, is, this is a ventral view of the uh, brainstem and the cerebellum in the CP angle. And what we saw in the lab was, um, you know, we want to get some external references to internal structures and we uh, reference that to the zygomatic root, which is something that we see right after a skin incision, and also to the external acoustic canal that we ha can have a reference before skin incision. And so for the middle fossa approaches, we know that um, we find from anterior to posterior the foramen ovale, then this, the uh, spinosum, and then this is the posterior aspect of GSPN, so we know that they are like about three uh, millimeters, one centimeter approximately, and less than two centimeters posteriorly to the anterior root, zygomatic root. But within that distance of the zygomatic root, we, we find most likely all these structures. So that's a message to, um, to know for uh, these pathologies or where we access this area. So uh, our tegment tympani is uh, around, is this area here. This is the arcuate eminence. And we know that medially, the most medial structure is the foramen ovale, then spinosum, and then more or less at the same uh, distance from the craniotomy, we have GSPN, and is almost immediately anterior to the external acoustic meatus. So looking at the middle fossa from above, this is a right side dissection. We see the, the cisternal, meatal, labyrinth, labyrinthine, and tympanic segment of the facial nerve. And this is the cochlea medially, the labyrinth laterally, the tympanic cavity. We see the tensor tympani and GSPN right here. This is the, um, uh, the space to perform an anterior petrosectomy. And here we have drilled also the, the uh, tegment tympani. This is the external acoustic canal. And in a close-up view, we see that uh, this is the facial nerve. This is nervous intermediates, and this is the superior vestibular nerve, the labyrinth laterally, the cochlea medially, 
And this is the tympanic membrane right here, the ossicles. And we can see that the EAC and the IAC are almost at the same level with slightly different angle. This is just to show the cochlear nerve going to the, towards the cochlea that has been opened here. And this is a dissection uh, to show everything from another point of view, uh, with, which I think it really helps understand this anatomy. So this is the left side, anterior is here, and this is posterior. And we see uh, the trigeminal nerve, Meckel's cave, uh, trigeminal ganglion. And then we see here, this is the what's left of the Peter's ridge, and this is the IAC with the facial nerve right here going down. This is GSPN. And this is the unroofed carotid artery that has been completely dissected. And then we have the cochlea medially and the labyrinth laterally. So just to show, uh, this is the right side. Again, uh, the brainstem has been divided and we see the facial nerve cochlear, superior and inferior vestibular. And this is where the root of the fifth nerve sits on the trigeminal impression. That's a great picture to show that Then the trigeminal elevation. And here we have drilled the meatus so we don't, uh, so we don't see the uh, medial depression. So this has been uh, you know, the middle fossa approach and going towards the steps for surgery so you can do a number of different incisions and dissection of the muscle, but anyway, the craniotomy is centered around the zygomatic root. This is the squamosal suture right here. And then we are going to find this, um, you know, the trigeminal, uh, the Meckel's cave with foramen ovale. This is spinosum, this is GSPN and the Peter's ridge. And we can find usually the IAC in a line lateral to the trigeminal impression. And then it projects usually towards the uh, posterior aspect of the zygomatic root. And also we can find it by bisecting the GSPN with our eminence. We can find uh, usually the angle of the IAC. So these are a couple of pictures uh, taken in the lab of the exposure of the IAC through the middle fossa, and then opening, and this is a view of the facial nerve and eight. And we can also put the uh, endoscope and have some assisted view. And looking at um, the structures to perform anterior petrosal approach, this is the Petrus, uh, wants to uh, say that this is the Petrus carotid, this is the cochlea, this is the IAC, and uh, the lateral aspect of Meckel's cave, and that is um, the petrus, the uh, the bone to drill that is safe to drill for anterior petrosectomy. And that's what we did here. This is the dura of the IAC, and dividing this dura, coagulated and coagulating and transecting the superior petrosal sinus, opening the dura in the middle fossa, and dividing the ten, we can get this. Um, nice exposure. And then when we put the uh, endoscope, we get additional exposure. This is five, this is seven and eight. And then we're gonna go through uh, a little bit of the transmastoid approaches that anatomically, um, there's the cortical aspect of the mastoid. We've come find the antrum the facial nerve, the sending part of the facial nerve. And this is the chorda tympani. We have the labyrinth right here, sigmoid sinus that has been skeletonized. And this is the anatomical um, picture that shows the lateral superior and posterior um, semicircular canals and the dura of the uh, breast sigmoid approach that is available for us to, uh, to open for this approach and the superior uh, petrosal sinus. And this is the sinodural angle right here. So in an anatomical surgical dissection, those are exactly the steps that we are going to go through, through the cortex, and then finding uh, the um, sigmoid sinus and the antrum. This is right here, the incus, 
the lateral, uh, the lateral semicircular canal starts to appear there uh, and starts to appear the, the facial nerve, lateral, posterior, and superior semicircular canals, and the wide exposure of the middle fossa and prosigmoid dura. And this is the facial nerve that has been dissected here. Drilling for a translab approach, drilling the labyrinth, and exposing the IAC here starts to appear and opening the dura over the nerves. This is the facial nerve. This is the ascending aspect, the mastoid segment. Opening, this is seven and eight. These are, are the lower cranial nerves. And this is the view that we get after the trans uh, lab approach. If we want to go further after drilling this and go through a transcochlear approach, we have to transpose the facial nerve by dividing the GSPN and pushing it posteriorly. And this is the cochlea and the axis that we get from that. And we can get to uh, the basilar artery. This is the fifth cranial nerve. So this is the seventh cranial nerve and the corda tympani and get access all the way towards the basilar and middle clivus. And com just combining the two, going through the mastoid, performing the craniotomy with the middle fossa combined approach and going exactly through the same steps that we went through the cortex, through the antrum, lateral semicircular canal, all the canals and just opening the dura in the posterior fossa, pre-sigmoid, opening the dura in the middle fossa and coagulating and dividing the superior petrosal sinus, looking for the fourth nerve be before dividing the tent. And that gives us a wide exposure of the ventral cranial vase, lower cranial nerves, seven and eight, fifth cranial nerves, and this is the uh, fourth nerve on the third cranial nerve here. Close a view and view even of the sixth nerve, this area, and right there with the dissector. So just a couple of uh, views of the retrosigmoid approach that we perform to get access to patho pathologies just as the posterior aspect of the temporal bone through the part of the uh, uh, right behind the sigmoid sinus. And this is a classical view of the right retrosigmoid approach and the seven and eight cranial nerves and drilling and exposing the internal acoustic uh, canal and getting a wide access um, and view also with assisted with the endoscope. So this is all I uh, wanted to uh, explain today and uh, in summary of the uh, diverse uh, approaches through the temporal bone. I just wanted to honor the memory as always of Dr. Roten and acknowledge uh, the help and wonderful dissections of my team in the Albany uh, Medical Center uh, Laboratory, our fellows, and also the wonderful team at the Mayo Clinic um, for all their support and help as well with uh, some of the dissections. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maria. That was, again, outstanding. Um, you, you made it quite simple, taking this complex bone and, and showing the stepwise dissections. Um, well, I, there are no questions from the audience, so I think, honestly, they are probably completely stunned by the beauty of the anatomy that they have seen. But, uh, but maybe I can ask a couple of questions, and I invite all of you to also ask questions. Uh, may I ask a question to Wen and Guillerme about choosing surgical approaches to the mesial temporal lobe? Uh, any, give us your wisdom about how far the transylvian approach can take us in the medial temporal lobe. Uh, do you have a specific mark you, you think of uh, between a transylvian versus a supracerebellar Transtentorial approach to the undersurface of the mesial temporal lobe. Um, what are your comments on, on, on that issue? Or any of you? <laughs> 
sorry, uh, Jacques, I just missed the first part of the question. Was for yeah, how do you choose when, how, how posterior can a transylvian approach take us? Uh, ignoring endoscopy, ignoring assisted endoscopy. Pure microsurgical resection of lesions of the mesial temporal lobe. How far back is it safe to go? And at okay. which point do we say Transylvian is, is not good enough? Let's go elsewhere. Posterior subtemporal, transcortical, transcoroidal fissure, or the very, I, I love that approach, supracerebellar transtentorial to the undersurface of the temporal lobe. That, that's my question. Okay, um, thank you for your question. I think that depends on the um, what kind of lesion you're dealing with. Let's start with the, the regular amygdala hippocampectomy, the normal anatomy, let's say. So you go from sylvan fissure. And then um, do, do, we, we all know that uh, the transition between the body of the hippocampus Axis is different. Sorry, when, by the way, your 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 video is off, unless you mean it to be off, it's fine. Oh no, I can't see you. Oh, sorry, sorry. Ah, yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> now I see you. Okay, good. Um, sorry again. So, uh, let's start with the uh, normal anatomy. I make the hippocampectomy. You know, the axis, direction, direction of the the body of the hippocampus is one, and then the tail of the hippocampus curves medially. So that's the point. You, you, you cannot reach reach the uh, tail of the hippocampus through the, um, the transylvian approach. And also it depends on the variation of anatomical variation of branches of MCA, MCA. It depends, you have to work between the branches. So this is one thing. So the answer is, at the transition between the body and the tail because the change of direction of the hippocampus. Is, uh, when is it useful for people to look to, on an axial MRI and see what coronal level, let's say a cavernoma, what coronal level is it in relation to tectum of midbrain? To, is it level with ambient cistern, quadrigeminal cistern? Can you give, give them a practical tip to decide when is the transylvian approach not okay. good enough? Okay, for instance, let's go um, from the front to back. So where the amygdala is located, anterior segment of the uncus, it's easy, transylvian. Tip of the uncus, it's easy, transylvian. Head of hippocampus is easy, transylvian. Just a little behind the head of hippocampus is a little bit more difficult, but it's it's not so difficult. And then behind that, behind the cruel cerebri, a gap between the posterior edge of, you know, the level of the lateral mesencephalicus sulcus. Right. And that's a kind of difficult. That's the yeah, transitional I agree. zone. I agree. Yeah. I agree. And anybody else want to wants to comment or on a variation of this question? You yeah, know, I agree with your comments. You know, we published some time ago with, the, and this is Evandro's Oliveira idea, on dividing middle temporal lobe in anterior, middle, and posterior segments, and describing the approaches based on that. Um, and it was the middle segment. If you are talking about cavernoma just in the middle segment, as you were saying, just a little the lateral mesencephalic sulcus is when you probably want to come from from behind from a supracerebellar route. Uh, if yeah. it's an, if it's a tumor that is anterior extending to the hippocampal body, then you can go from anterior because the tumor takes you there. But the right. limited atrium is the tail of the hippocampus. Juan, can I ask you a question about uh, comment on uh, the view of the foramen lacerum seen contralaterally through the transmaxillary and donasal approach? Does any of what you expose today, do you, how would you modify, or do you modify anything of what you describe today when you do the approach contralaterally? Um, uh, yeah, I think you're going to get to, do you need to expose the carotid that extensively you use a contralateral transmaxillar approach, right? Right. Um, you, usually I still would do it. I, I, I add a contralateral transmaxillar approach when I, when my, I have to drill the petrous apex. Uh, for example, you have a condosarcoma or a cordoma and you can remove the soft part, but I cannot get a drill 
working behind the calorie through an endonasal approach to drill that little margin to get a clean margin. Then I would use a CTM approach to give that extra margin of bond. But I would still expose the calorie the same way. Right. Um, Maria, may I ask you to comment, uh, you know, Van Loveren and uh, Khaled Aziz, I think in 99 or 2000, reminded us there is the clival pit. Uh, sometimes the clivus is too concave. And I've, I've had this in many, many surgical cases where the retrosigmoid gives you a much better angle than the pre-sigmoid approach. Uh, mm -hmm. it, can you comment or give the audience, I don't know, tips on what to look for to try uh, to, in approaching a petroclival uh, intradural lesion? Yeah. Um, uh, regard, you know, about regarding yes. the anatomy of the temporal bone. Yes, exactly. So there's that concavity there. And I think it's very important if we are looking at uh, a lesion that goes above the tent and we are thinking about a transtentorial approach and a, a transpetrosal approach dividing the tent. So that angle of the cl uh, clival um, curve is really difficult to get with the presigmoid approach. And especially we are doing a retro lab exposure. So in that case, what I've done for some petrochival tumors is uh, besides going pre-sigmoid, I also use the retrosigmoid part of my craniotomy. And I use that to exactly go to the most medial part that is you know, exactly in the clivus, like be right behind the clivus. So I think as we are doing that, if, um, in my slides, I show that there was a quite generous posterior part of the craniotomy for the trans the transpetrosal combined approach that included the retrosigmoid part. So I have used that uh, for extensive petrochival meningiomas with combining both um, both um, approaches. Or of course, combining retro I mean posterior petrosal with anterior petrosal, working on both sides of the exactly. otic capsule, which... Yeah, if it's in the superior part, yes. Right. And yeah, exactly. So we can combine actually all the three approaches if we need to in extensive lesions. And I think those of us who work with neuroautologists all the time, it's hard yeah. to tell them how important it is when they do the drilling to give us, I, I always tell them, give me at least a centimeter and a half of clearance behind the sigmoid. So we can push the sigmoid back to you really utilize it. And they always leave the, I don't know, but your neurotoxins, they leave the island, the Bill's island on the sigmoid sinus, that bone that gets in the way. So anyway, uh, uh, colleagues, any, anybody of you, any of you has questions to each other or any, any comments? Yeah, uh, Juan Carlos, uh, in your experience with the, the pterygo sphenoid fissure, uh, the specimens that you've uh, worked with so far, is that a complete separation between these two bones or partial? You think it's uh, evolutionarily a, a separate bone like the tympanic part of the uh, temporal bone? So yeah, definitely. The, so you don't see the separation in surgery because they are fused, but there is this fibrous tissue in between because they have different origin. And actually something that is very interesting, I've done some transclival approaches and transcribal approaches in children. And you can find more cartilage-like tissue in that fissure, which is very fast. It looks like a chondrosarcoma in the fissure. It looks like cartilage tissue, very fascinating. Um, oh, now I have, sorry, I have a couple of questions from the audience. I guess we got them going now. Uh, Maria, a question from Marce Marco Mello. What is the, well, what's the best approach for petroclival meningioma, pre-sigmoid or not? Do you want to answer him in a blanket way or what would you like to say? I will, <laughs> so I think, um, so it depends on the, how big the meningioma is, how high it goes. Uh, definitely if it goes above the tentorium and you have to divide the tentorium and it goes also below, quite below the tentorium and you don't think you can get everything through an anterior petrosal approach, then you have, I think you have to use the presigmoid and divide the tent. But with that big um, you know, exposure that we ha can have, just not only the pre-sigmoid, but also combined with the middle fossa and also part of the retrosigmoid approach, you can actually keep working with this if you want these three windows. 
and that gives you access. But it depends on exactly, you know, how big the meningioma is and how extensive, how medial it is, and superior and inferior um, regarding the tent. So I think the tent would be the landmark as well. Yeah. Dr. Ribas, can I, could you answer Amanad Kwastumal? Uh, how about the superior temporal sulcus approach for mesial temporal, uh, well, for, yeah, I guess for mesial temporal lobe. Is that a, anatomically, is it a sound way to approach the medial temporal lobe to go through the superior temporal sulcus? I think the superior temporal sulcus is a great pathway, a great corridor to, uh, to uh, temporal lesions. It depends, of course, on the, in the, the, the anatomy of the lesion, but I like very much the superior temporal approach. I was just uh, remembered that when you expose the temporal lobe uh, and you see a sulcus in the temporal surface, you're seeing the superior temporal sulcus. To see the inferior temporal sulcus, you have to have a very, very basal craniotomy because the, the, the inferior temporal gyrus has a very small height. But uh, as Wen said, the middle temporal gyrus is related with the ventricle directly there, and the superior temporal sulcus is a great uh, corridor depending on the side of the lesion. I like it very much, just as I like the superior frontal sulcus very much. It's another great corridor for surgery. Hey, Jacques, can I ask a question to Guillerme? Yeah. Hey, Guillerme, uh, good to see you. So I enjoyed your presentation and you know, the, the, the area of the ventral striatum and substantia nominata, that is such a difficult area, uh, especially to do surgery on. Uh, so wh what is your experience? You know, I've, I've had a, a summit of cases over the years where I always, I'm always hesitant to be aggressive in that area because of the potential morbidity and, of course, the proximity of the lenticular steroid arteries, but also the accumbens uh, on all this area. How aggressive are you in that, taking tumor in that location? Well, uh, I, I was already expecting for this question, so I had thought about it. <laughs> Number one, unfortunately, I don't have this much experience to answer you, but uh, I've been fascinated with this region since I was uh, doing some dissections with Leonard Heimer and then uh, with Rotten and everything that I've been seeing through all these decades. And uh, I think that it depends very much in the lesion. Number one, uh, if it's not, it's cavernoma, for example, I think it's a great lesion because they spread apart both the fibers and also the lenticular strike artery. So they, if, 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 if they show up in the surface, you, you, you can sort of uh, get them out of there. The infiltrating tumors are very bad. The, the small experience I have with uh, mostly malignant tumors, unfortunately not good. I got some hemiplegias with this trying to get there. So I, I think there are three basic uh, ways to think about getting there. One is the, through the inferior limiting sulcus, then inferior limiting or anterior limiting sulcus, depending on the, the, the site if the lesion is lateral. And of course, then you have the eye off. you have to think if these fibers are spread, if you're right side or, or, or left side. And if it's at, at the base, uh, I think you can go uh, superior to the carotid bifurcation as Michael Lawton had showed in some uh, cavernomas in this region. He has a beautiful paper about some cavernomas in these difficult sites. And uh, I think if it shows up in the anterior periphery substance, you can go for it through the, through the bifurcation. And if it's very high, and if it's higher and very medial, more related with the head of the caudate, of course, you have the transventricular approaches. But uh, I agree, uh, the lenticular stride arteries make it very, very difficult to get there. I was very impressed recently with Ugo Ture in one of these lectures, in one of these web seminars, showing a, a tumor he did that was a, an original tumor of the substantia nominata, of this ventral striatal region. And he went it through the temporal strand to, the, to this region we're talking about and did a beautiful job with this. And he could even dissect some of the perforators. So it depends yeah. on the lesion and, and unfortunately it depends on the surgeon as well. It depends very much on the surgeon experience. I, I would say, unfortunately, I, I would say fortunately, it does depend on the surgeon's experience. <laughs> <laughs> one can, this is, this one is a big may, issue when you talk about education in neurosurgery. Yeah. I think the great problem in our specialty is that it's not just like prescribing a drug. What what approach you prefer? You go right. anterior or posterior. 
it, this is very, very complicated. Depend on your knowledge, on your experience. And uh, there's many different ways to skin a cat, and um, sometimes it's, not, it's better not to skin it. <laughs> right. Uh, Juan, may I challenge you about that case, the melanocytic uh, tumor that is obviously, was, I, unless I misunderstood, it's entirely intradural. So why not go retrosigmoid and do, you know, you're going to go back and do a second phase now, retrosigmoid. Retrosigmoid could have done the whole thing much more simply. Could you, and also let me take you, please defend for us the use of the endonasal transclival approach for purely intradural lesions when there are good open approaches for it. Well, I think, you know, of course, that's controversial. And as we just said, it depends on the uh, experience of everybody, each, each, each one of us. But in, in general, generally speaking, lower transclival, lower clival, re, ventral clival lesions, um, in my opinion, are very well approached in the nasally because you go directly into the tumor and you don't have any brainstem in your way. The nerves are on the sides and you have a phenomenal corner. Now, there are technical limitations, of course. Now, when the tumor go is ventral lateral, then it's opening a pathway for you. But that wasn't the case with this tumor. This tumor had like nodules. So it had a huge nodule, then it separated another nodule in the petrous apex. So this, in my opinion, called for two separate stages. I think it would be having a tremendously difficult approach to a retrosigmoid, and I think it would have required a pre-sigmoid or some transpetrosal approach to do it safely, in my opinion. I don't know. It had a straight shot, you know, down the petrous. But anyway, I just wanted to bring the topic. We're not going to discuss the yeah. specifics of the case further. Question from, I guess, maybe for Maria. Uh, Ma from Martin Pilonieta, do you have any tip for the GSPN dissection to avoid facial nerve palsy? You're muted, Maria. You're muted. You hear me? Now I can. Okay. So just um, going carefully from posterior, usually from posterior to anterior, and also having your neuromonitoring too, and knowing exactly when and where to look for. And so I think that's why, you know, this, um, the study that we did in the lab, like we know that, you know, it's uh, medial about uh, two centimeters, the posterior aspect of it. And we know that it's just anterior to the external auditory canal and the posterior part of the zygomatic root. So you know where to start looking for it. And then you prepare your uh, intraoperative monitoring, and when it stimulates for a facial, you know that you are on the GSPN. Great. Um, and I think the last question, because I want uh, the panelists to, to go back to their uh, evening, uh, to Juan from Alejandro Mercado. Do you have any experience, Juan, with approaching contra uh, jugular, I guess, glomus tumors through the contralateral transmaxillary endoscopic approach? No, you know, I do, I do think that uh, tumors, glomodugulary tumors are, uh, should be approached with a posterior lateral approach, whatever, depending on the type, you know, posterior lateral approach, not endonasal. I, because these are primary tumors of the jugular foramen. I think it's very important to understand how to extend an approach from the transclival route into the jugular foramen. Uh, and therefore the CTM approach for that is very important, but, but um, primary tumors of the jugular foramen need a posterior approach. Tumors in the clibos or pitoclibal region extending to the jugular foramen, in my opinion, benefit more from an endonasal approach, perhaps with a CTM. Great. So it's 7.30. We can keep going for a long time. I want to thank everybody, the audience, particularly the panelists. Thank you. Spectacular session. I have no doubt this session will be viewed multiple times on our YouTube channel. We had many people on YouTube uh, as well as on Zoom today. And I bid you all farewell and thank you and stay safe, everybody. Thanks a lot. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.